Hello and welcome to Japanimation Station, an anime podcast brought to you by the folks at the Weekly Stuff Podcast. I'm Sean Chapman. And I'm Jonathan Lack. And we are here once again to dive into the wild and wacky world of anime this week on the show. We are starting our watch through of the trilogy of films adapting the third and final route from Fate Stayed Night. This is Heaven's Feel, movie number one, Presage Flower. What a, what a fucking movie, Sean. Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was the exact reaction I had. I have obviously <laughs> seen the Heaven's Feel movies before, um, so I knew that they were incredibly good. Uh, but yes, I finished watching movie number one for the second time last night and was like, fuck it. Hey, these movies are really good. Oh, my God. It's it's really wild because, you know, we've talked a lot about on the podcast this year how well sort of fate in the anime adaptations work as as their own sort of series trilogy of anime basically of fate mm-hmm. zero and then unlimited blade works and then this and i think this first movie presage flower is really interesting to me because it is so for me being someone who is is fate zero was my introduction and i have not played the visual novel everything in this movie is disorienting it is putting you off balance it, it nothing goes how you expect it to go both in that this Mm -hmm. is an alternate route from what you've seen before but also it feels like there are just rules being broken everywhere in the plot it feels like the characters are being pushed in emotional directions we haven't seen before the entire idea of what the holy grail war is is being significantly challenged there's just so much going on in this film and it doesn't even particularly build to a resolution like you have way more questions by the end of this film than you have answers But I also think it finds this incredibly beautiful, elegant note to end on and still feels like a full cinematic experience. Uh, And that just makes it so unique and fascinating to me. It's really beautiful and challenging and made me just want to watch parts two and three right Mm -hmm. then and there. But of course, rules of the podcast, I have to wait. Uh, And I am excited because this is this is fantastic so far. Yeah, I think it's like an incredible feat of adaptation, what they've done in order to take that third route, Heaven's Feel, which is the most like extreme of the roots, like it has the most different tonally and stylistically. um, And the plot is like way more out there, right? Um, Because it's because it's meant to be the conclusion, right? All three of the stories are meant to build on each other. And so trying to adapt that, particularly trying to adapt into a series of films, where you have to like naturally kind of compress some things together um, and then also figure out this kind of three-part narrative structure to base the three films around. Like th- that is not, I think, an easy task, but they do it so incredibly well because as you say, Jonathan, like honestly, there's not that much that happens in the plot of this first movie. Like particularly since I know where the whole, what the whole story is, like I had forgotten that you really don't get that far overall into the plot of Heaven's Feel in this movie. But, you know, they do need to spend a good time, like two hours, and all three of these movies are basically two hours apiece. But you need a full two-hour chunk just to, like, sort of ease yourself into the world of Heaven's Feel specifically and the tone and the style and start to sort of tease out how is this different? Like, where is this now branching and what is that causing and, like, what is, like, sort of the butterfly effect of how things are going differently this time around for the Holy Grail War 
Um, and so they are very sort of like steady with how they pace this movie. And yeah, even though there's not a huge amount of stuff that happens in the main plot from like a Holy Grail war perspective, like you don't really know what's going on. You don't know what the shadow is. You don't have any real like kind of framework for understanding where this main plot is going. Um, they do tell such a touching story that's so clearly centered around Shiro and his relationship with Sakura um, and kind of how it started. And then like, how is it going to change from here? Uh, and I think that shaping of the movie is so elegant. And a lot of it is by knowing like where to sort of create new scenes that didn't exist in the game or how to adjust existing scenes from the game in smart ways to give a full shape to this film. Yeah, I, I'm really curious to ask you about some adaptational choices because, again, having not played the visual novel, but just looking at what they came up with for this first two-hour movie, it feels like this must have been one of the hardest adaptations they had to do mm -hmm. because it seems like there was not a clear, easy, like, here is the big thing we can build this movie around. It's an accumulation of little things and mysteries and and moments that feel transgressive or that feel on the opposite side touching and sweet, but always kind of like there's an air of menace around it. And it really is, like, of everything we've watched so far, the closest to being kind of a two-hour mood piece with some big action scenes and plot movements. Um... But I think in, in lesser hands, even if it was just a lesser production, this could feel, I think, off as a movie because it doesn't get like what Sakura's larger role in the story is or is going to be is not arrived at in this first uh -huh. film. And I was kind of expecting it to. And I don't mind. I think it ends on the perfect, beautiful note. Um, but it is it is a challenging, interesting film, and it's it's fantastic. And on that production side, we should note we are now fully contiguous with the production of Demon Slayer Kimetsu no Yaiba yes. for UFO Table. So this movie is twenty seventeen, right? Because mm -hmm. it's twenty seventeen, nineteen, and twenty are the Heaven's Feel yeah. movies, and um, that is the same. This is a little before Kimetsu starts, but this is around the same time they would have started work on this. The final Heaven's Feel movie came out like a month before Mugen Train, the Demon Slayer movie, which, what a what a year that was for UFO uh -huh. Table. Um, kind of crazy. But that means we are, you know, kind of at present-day UFO Table when we arrive at Heaven's Feel. And it is it has been such a cool journey to go from Fate Zero, which is extremely handsome TV production, to Unlimited Blade Works, which is one of the most impressive TV anime productions of all time, to this, which is just full movie production values, scene after scene that just really blew me away, either on the level of shot choice, storyboarding, color work, atmosphere, or like, how are they animating this thing? Like the big fight between Lancer and um, Assassin, Assassin on the freeway, which is probably the best action sequence. I think we've talked about this fucking season. Mm -hmm. So like, it's incredible as a production too, just out of this world. Yeah, no, top to bottom, 100%. And then obviously it's going to be true of all three of these movies is it is like top tier. This is like this is the best stuff that Ufo Table has put out, I think effectively is like this in Movie and Train, um, which makes sense because it's like they're the movie productions that are the most recent. Um, and I actually would put these movies above Movie and Train for me on the production level. Um, and it is just like really stunning and i think also it is the it is not just the technical production but also as you identify it is the sort of artistic and creative stuff they do like i find the editing in this movie like very powerful because it's it how it builds that tension because heaven's feel is tense it should feel dangerous it should feel unsettling the nature of the story and like the very sharp stark kind of upsetting cuts that happen not upsetting in that like you know sometimes it's upsetting because there's like really incredibly gory shit that happens i had forgotten just how gory this movie is in two specific spots um but but just in terms of like the unsettling nature that it will sh cut very suddenly and that like the spar the sparse nature of some like the sound design and the music choices how long this movie will go with no music um and just like little sound design tricks um and you just watching these shots of like nature and then any cut suddenly to a totally another location um it just builds the sense of place and tone so perfectly as you're like sort of getting slowly wound up and you don't really know why it's so tense like what is happening um, but I think it's like very much putting you in the mindset of 
our two leads, particularly Shido, but also Sakura, as we're starting to learn that, like, and if you know from Fate Zero, you know that there's something off about her, right? That she has this very pleasant exterior, but she is hiding something inside of her. Um, the sort of these traumas and stuff we know she has gone through. Um, and so you're getting put into this, like, perspective of people who are sort of othered from the world because of those experiences, right? And you get that most distinctly with Shiro with his, like, suddenly getting flashes of his, like, of the fire and all that stuff that happened to him in the past. And the way that that tone and style permeates throughout the entire film to put you into that mindset is really remarkable. Yeah. No, it's incredible. It's really cool to come full circle with UFO Table in our UFO Table Moonworks season uh -huh. because we started with Garden of Sinners, which is this series of movies that are stylistically very bold and have, you know, more adult content. And then we have the two TV shows, Zero and Unlimited Blade Works. And I feel like Heaven's Feel coming back around, it feels like this is kind of going back into the zone of some of what we saw on Garden of mm -hmm. Sinners. I mean, there were very clear flashes for me of, of movie one, movie five, some of the big, like, concrete moments, uh, certainly how they do some of the romance and bonding and just dealing with trauma and space. It's It, it makes... I mean, obviously, this season was always going to be Garden of Sinners to Heaven's Field because that is the real chronology. But also, like, there's something very poetic about coming back to this point where I feel like they're going back into movies with a Type Moon adaptation with everything they've learned over the years. And it's very cool to see that. Yeah, and that Heaven's Field fundamentally as a story is a lot closer tonally to Garden of Sinners than any of the other Fate stories are. Like, it definitely, to me, it, it is in that Nasu writing space where it's, like, very horror-adjacent. Um, Tsukihime, which I'm playing the remake of right now, is also very much in this like horror adjacent tonality that Kata no Kyokai has, that Heaven's Feel has, that isn't there as much in like the Fate Root or in Unlimited Blade Works. Um, and like it is fun to get back into that sort of slightly transgressive space with the violence and the like kind of upsetting tone of the piece. Yeah. So why don't we talk about the the history here? And I guess the first question would be they could have probably made this any fucking way they wanted to after the success of Zero and Unlimited Blade Works. Why movies? Why a trilogy? Uh, what a what brought them to Heaven's Feel being uh, a film trilogy over these number of years? Yeah, I mean, well, the big thing is that this was always, well, not necessarily always, always, but this was sort of part of the idea when they started doing the, the sort of UFO table Fate Stay Night project was that they would do Heaven's Feel. Once they settled on, we're going to do Unlimited Blade Works for the TV show, they're like, we want to do Heaven's Feel as well. Um, and I think, like, the movie thing eventually came around pretty naturally that I just think, like, it, it's hard for me to imagine Heaven's Feel as a TV show. I don't think it's structured in a way that is super beneficial to a TV show style production. It's almost, like, too... One, the content is too violent and the content is too sexually explicit if you're doing the PC game, the original version of the story, which they are. Um, you get, like, one scene in here that sort of hints at it. You get Shiro's dream. We're going to get more stuff that's more explicit later on. So it's like, that's one thing that, like, pushes Heaven's Feel is it's tonally, it is, you you know, it is it is a little bit outside of the normal TV show space. Um, you would have to censor it. I mean, you know, Fate Zero is censored in its TV release. I think Unlimited Blade Works is very mildly censored in, like, one or two shots in the TV show release. Um, Heaven's Feel you would have to you have to change the content of it if you're going to make it a TV show. But then also I just think like it's it is so serialized as a story, like it's so maybe serialized isn't even quite the right word, but it's so sort of fluid as a story that I think it makes sense to want to do the longer form chunks in movies rather than TV show production. Um then one thing that they also did so that our main creative team we talked about this before we talked about this movie but it's directed by Tomonori uh, Sudo and is written by Akira Hiyama or adapted by Akira Hiyama. Obviously, Kino Konasu worked on all of these projects as well. Just to be clear, like he also was like in the room working with these guys on adapting the script and stuff. Um, but the specific screenplay was Hiyama, and both of them were the main creators behind the eighth Garden of Sinner movies, Gardens, Garden of Sinners movie as well. So that extra one that they made in 2013 after the original bunch. So it's like that same basic team coming together to make the the Heaven's Feel movies. Um, yeah, and then, you know, I think the original plan was to have these all come out one year after the other, but, you know, obviously that, like, one thing is that these movies, the pandemic hits 
about halfway through, right? It hits around the time the second movie comes out. Um, and then also making between the second and third, because yeah. I was looking this up last night because movie one ends with a preview for movie two that says 2018 movie two missed 2018. It came out January 2019. Yeah. And then movie three came out October 20 or like August or September 2020. So I think movie three probably would have been early 2020 pandemic hits in like January, February 2020. And so it gets pushed to late 2020. Next yeah. to, I imagine it was not probably supposed to come out right next to Mugen Train, no. but they wound up coming right out, up out right next to each other. But yeah, I mean, and that's like it, you know, there's not like a lot of big stories about where like the production history of this in terms of like where it came from. I think it was like kind of a natural choice of if you're doing Fate Stay Night and like are you know they're adapt like their adaptations of like Unli- Fate Zero and Unlimited Blade Works are incredibly popular. The Blu-rays and DVDs sold incredibly well. They won a bunch of fucking awards when they came out in Japan. Um, so it's like, it's a natural thing to do. And Heaven's Feel is um, like a fan favorite. Like I think it's for many people who are like big fans of Fate Stay Night, it's kind of your favorite story because it is the one that goes the furthest. It is the most extreme. It is the one that, that resolves the story and it's like sort of, I think, when you get to the end of Heaven's Feel, it puts the whole Fate Stay Night project in perspective of this is what the story was about all along. You needed to go through these phases to get there. So I think it's like if you're a big fan of the material, which the people working at Table are, it is like a natural thing that you're like, you got to do it. You got to do Heaven's Feel. Like there's no way you can just leave that on the table. Um, and, I, and I do think it was very smart for them to decide to do it as movies because I have a very hard time imagining this as a TV show. I don't know how you would do it. I think it'd be much harder to adapt. It's hard to do as movies also, but I think it's an easier process than trying to make it a like 24 episode TV show. Yeah. And obviously just watching it, um, the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> this is a tremendously made film and it is hard to imagine the content of this film as a TV show. It's It's even hard for me to imagine the version of this where like, you cut it up into episodes to put on TV the way they did for the Mugen Train uh, half yeah. season of Demon Slayer. I don't know where the hell you would start and end, let alone obviously there's some shots that you would have to completely change because of the gore quotient in this film, which is very violent. But yeah, I mean, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine the same thing is true of playing Heaven's Feel in the visual novel. But for me, going from Zero to Unlimited Blade Works to Heaven's Feel, there is just a constant what the hell is going on mindfuck uh-huh. quality yes. to this movie of like everything is out of place nothing is going as it should even knowing this is an alternate route things are going to be different different does not necessarily mean there is a grim reaper bursting out of the chest of assassins yes. and most of the champions are or of the um, servants are dead by the end of the first movie and saber has just disappeared and there is an imaginary number space they call it thing that is like out there swallowing up the shadows um and there's just death everywhere and nothing seems to be going right and just there you are constantly put off balance and then in the center of it you have shiro who is fundamentally obviously the same character that you know from the other roots or from unlimited blade works but this is such a different valence on him because his key relationship this time is sakura And so, you know, Sakura already, whether you're coming from Zero or from other versions of the of the story, clearly this is a person who is defined by trauma and abuse. Um, Most notably in the text here, we have Shinji, um, who is an abusive brother. But of course, if you know from Fate Zero, and I assume there are other hints around the the edges in Fate Stay Night, other stuff with the Mato family. Um, And that brings out this side of of, uh, Shiro who is also defined by trauma, not abuse. He has not been abused, but he has gone through significant traumas. And so it is this movie that is in some sense traumatic to watch because the story is like literally taking you in directions you violently do not expect. The style of the movie is harsh, as you mentioned earlier, Sean, of like some of those edits and some of the way I think sound design works in this movie. And then you have these two characters at the center who are essentially trauma bonding and the arc of this movie is them kind of reaffirming that bond through their pain and it even though the story does not like reveal anything by the end other than mysteries i feel like there's a significant emotional journey that you go over in these two hours 
Yeah, and I think it's the way that they they capture that in the way they structure the film so perfectly. Because in in the film, I think it's much starker immediately than Heaven's Feel because there's just a fundamental stylistic shift, right? Obviously, in the visual novel, the whole style of the visual novel doesn't change all of a sudden. It's more like the prose style does start to change, and it's like, but it's a little bit more subtle as you start getting into those choices. But for me, the moment in Heaven's Feel in the game where you all of a sudden you're like, wait, what the fuck is happening? Um, where like there's a really sudden shift is when True Assassin comes out. Because you have, because in the game in particular, you've gone through two routes. You've played like 40, 50 hours of that game, knowing Assassin as Sasaki Kojiro, the guy summoned by Caster who guards the temple. Because Saber fights him in both the Fate route and Unlimited Blade Works. So he's a fairly major figure in both those routes. Um, and then all of a sudden in Heaven's Feel, you get the scene one that in the game is very startling because it's n not from Shido's POV. So you don't know how you like you're kind of unanchored from your POV when you see it, which is pretty rare in Fate Stay Night to give you those scenes. And then it's just like all of a sudden this thing bursts out of the assassin we know. Um, and it's very it's frightening. Like I find assassin in Heaven's Feel very frightening because it you understand how terrifying the servants are because they're so powerful and you know that really fucking well by this point. Um, but like the one that should be the most terrifying is kind of the most likable, right? Sasaki Kojiro is like the most pleasant of them all in some ways, you know, even more so in some ways than Saber who has her like obsession with the grail. Sasaki Kojiro is a cool dude and he's got his like honor as like a samurai and all that kind of stuff that makes him very pleasant. And he feels like he's kind of an assassin in name only. You can see the assassin connection because he's very dexterous or whatever. He's like, if it was a video game, he's like an agility based character, but he doesn't feel like an assassin. And then all of a sudden this like shadow with a skull face bursts out of him and just starts and murders Caster and uh, Kuziki Sensei immediately. You're like, oh, this is an assassin servant. This is what the assassin class actually is. Especially in the game, you haven't seen Fate Zero, which has obviously the assassin in Fate Zero is kind of based off the true assassin here. Um, and so that whole notion that there's a new servant all of a sudden, it's actually assassin and it feels dangerous and upsetting in this way that like he's killing these characters that you know and like, even if they were kind of villainous with Caster and Kuzuki Sensei, you still like those characters. Um, and they are just brutally murdered and dispatched. And then Lancer gets killed, um, which he's also like a fan favorite, you know. Um, and it's just immediately everything, see, as soon as Assassin appears, everything starts going haywire. And then you also have the shadow that starts appearing, that starts consuming the corpses of all the servants. Um, and then that's when you start just getting the prose gets fucking crazy and almost Lovecraftian, which I think they kind of capture in this movie that when you're looking at that shadow, you kind of can't understand it. It doesn't seem like it should exist. Um, and it kind of breaks your brain to even look at it. You know, Shido passes out when he gets touched by it. Um, and so, yeah, that's where you start feeling everything just becomes completely unspooled. Um, and how exactly Sakura fits into this is not immediately clear, but like it be, feels so appropriate because you're starting to get into who is this girl actually. Because in the game, you wouldn't know any of the Mato stuff until Tosaka discovers it in that scene here where she learns about it. I'm pretty sure that's where you learn in the game. So you know about like Shinji is a piece of shit, but you don't know the depth to the kind of stuff that she has been subjected to. Um, and like you're slowly kind of picking at that, realizing there's a lot more to her than you thought. Like their pain goes a lot deeper than you ever realized. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, as you're hinting there, this does work differently as part three of the anime version versus part three of the video game version. Um, obviously, this is movie one of three, but you know what I mean? The Heaven's yes. Feel project as part three. And it is interesting for me as someone who's only gone the anime route. And so Fate Zero was part one, not the Fate route. There is kind of a coming full circle quality to this because you're going back to Sakura and the Mato stuff that was big in Zero but not in Unlimited Blade Works. And you have more discussion of Kyoritsugu from that show. So you have Kotomine tell, you know, Shiro directly, this is who Kyoritsugu was and he and I were enemies. And he doesn't tell the full truth because he's Kotomine, yes. but he, he talks about that. And then you have Saber actually explain like, hey, Kyoritsugu was the one who summoned me and I worked for the, you know, Einsveels and all of that stuff or uh, Einsburns. Einsburns. And, yeah. Uh, Yuri Sviel von Einsburg. <laughs> anyway, and so you have all of that where Soshiro is learning things that he never knew that we know from Fate Zero. And so it also, this is just the, 
Some of this is just, I, I think the story winds up naturally working this way. Some of this is choices UFO Table has made in their adaptations. But it felt very natural to me so far as like the big conclusive start of the conclusive chapter of a story that begun began in anime with fate zero and that's also just hugely impressive to me again considering there is a third of the video game they technically did not adapt yeah but it is one of the main things of where like fate zero helps fill in those gaps because if you had played the game you would know most of this that stuff about kiritsugu as a player already and so one of the big changes is that information gets revealed to shido and it's more explicitly clear at the beginning of the story now so it's like he which is, you know, which is important because now he's, you know, you're able to bring in that information that the audience knows and gives that to this character so that he can grow from that point. And it's so it's one of the many things in Heaven's Feel that makes it this sort of pseudo sequel story, right? It's not a sequel in terms of linear continuity of events, but it is a sequel in terms of thematic content and ideas. Um, and so this is a Shiro that is building off of, in many ways, the experiences we've seen him go through in the game in the fate route, but then also in unlimited blade works. Um, and then you also see that like it's diverging really prominently. At least we get one scene here where Archer says like, I got to put my personal business aside. Like it, it looks like I'm not going to be able to deal with my personal shit this time around because <laughs> yes, because the shadow has shown up and like, there's something more wrong going on here. Um, so you're starting to see like those events and all that stuff, you know, like that is being put aside. Um, and we are giving Shido some specific information to help him grow from some of those places that we saw him at. So that way we can arrive at a different place than where he was at the end of Unlimited Blade Works. And we're starting to build those blocks here. Yeah, I put that in my notes because I loved it. It's Archer says, it's hardly the time to prioritize personal vendettas. And it's like, it's so great to just, he's like hand waving the events of Unlimited Blade Works of like, man, Archer, you have no idea if you chose not to uh, go this route, it would be a totally different adventure, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, and you're right, it, it does. And I think, I want to talk about the first half hour of this movie because you get a full opening credit sequence about a half hour in. And until then, it's basically the equivalent of the prologue material, which we talked a lot about in the Unlimited Blade Works episodes, that series premieres with two full hour-long episodes, one of which is yes. adapting the actual prologue to the visual novel, and one of which is adapting the first chapter-ish thing of the of yeah. the visual novel that is there technically in every route, right? Because it's you play mm -hmm. through it to get to the branching path. And so there is theoretically two hours of material that they kind of have to move through in the first half hour of this film to get back to where the story diverges. But they're ex they're incredibly smart about what they, they do here. Obviously, the first hour, the actual prologue, is pretty uh, Tosaka Rin-centric, and so you don't need it here, and it would be redundant. Um, but then with the other stuff, they mainly wind up showing you either they go back earlier in the story to stuff where how did... Uh, Shiro and Sakura become friends and you get a really beautiful montage, a slow sort of a montage is actually really the wrong word. It's a series of sort of scenes that move through time, but it's a montage is fast. This is slow. And you get that side of it. And then we do get stuff that is from episode one of Unlimited Blade Works that is from the early part of the visual novel, but framed and played very differently. And then at the big sort of point where things kick in, we go into the opening credits and they recap it sort of visually through that, but they expect you to have already seen it. And it's all done just very artfully and seamlessly. And I really, really was struck by how well they achieved all of that. Yeah, it was one of the things when I first watched this movie, I was very curious how they would deal with it. Because, of course, when you play the game, what you do is... Um, unless maybe, you know, if you're taking a big break between roots, maybe you would play through the beginning again. But if you're like me, you know, like I finished in the Tsukihime remake, I finished the first route and then I started over from the beginning and I fucking hit that skip button and it just <laughs> and just went through all that stuff. And then maybe I hit a scene I remember liking and I'd read through that and then I'd skip. Um, and, you know, obviously in a movie, you can't just do that, but you also can't just do the first two hours of the TV show again. Um, you know, maybe if you're like really cheap, you could just like cut that shit together and try to do it, but it would kill your whole movie. The pacing of the movie would die. Um, any returning fan would be bored out of their fucking mind. Um, and so they just made the smart choice to one, say, fuck it. 
This is a movie for people who saw Unlimited Blade Works. Like, if you did not see that TV show, don't come. Because you're not going to know. Like, there would be no way to understand what the fuck's happening in this movie if you did not at least watch Unlimited Blade Works. They do not explain really what the Holy Grail War. They don't explain what servants are. They don't explain what temp command seals are. Or any of that shit. None of that is explained here. Um, you know, the most you get is you get, like, maybe 10% of the scene where Kotomine explains stuff to Shido. But they only show you the parts that are, like really relevant to Shido's character motivations about him wanting to deal with the Grail because of its connection to his past. And they cut out most of the other exposition in that scene, which is what they should have done. Um, what, the right one choice. thing you get is you do get over the opening credits, a narration by Grandpa Mato, the, what's his uh -huh. actual name? Mato. Uh, Zoken. Zoken. Talking about the Holy Grail War. And that is kind of your, just in case you forgot, here's what it is kind of monologue, but it is, it is not a like true exposition. It is definitely expecting you, like, you've seen Fate Zero, you've seen Unlimited Blade Works, this is part three, let's go. Yeah, so it's like, that's the right choice is to say, replicate as much as you can of the phenomenon. You're just skipping through that stuff. You can't just, you need to reference it enough that, like, there is a connective material that makes sense. Like, you can't just cut it out entirely. You need to have the equivalent of skipping through it, um, like, from the game. Um, but then that leaves you the question of, how do you start the movie then? Um, and they, and so all of that stuff, about like 20 or so minutes of material at the very beginning, that is all the flashback stuff, that's original material, basically. Like some of it is stuff that you know happened because it's sort of narrated to you in a, this has happened in the past and you kind of read it prosaically that way in the game. Um, but most, but none of it is dramatized directly. You don't see those scenes play out. Um, and that was the thing when I first watched this movie, I thought was just like a brilliant choice was to trace the relationship of Shido and Sakura directly from when they first meet, like, 18 months before the beginning of the game. Um, that's also kind of gives you a little bit of the context around why Shido leaves the archery club and some of his, like, weird relationship with Shinji. Um, and then this, in seeing this, like, young Sakura, who is a lot sort of colder and darker feeling, um, and then slowly through her interactions with her senpai, right, starts to kind of, like, come a bit more out of her shell and get more life to her and kind of becomes the Sakura that you know, and, you know, then hooking up to that moment where she shows up and she is now in high school with him. Um, and, you know, the, and now she looks like soccer. She's like grown up a lot over the course of that year. Um, and I think that was just a really smart choice because it centers this movie on what it needs to be centered on, which is Shido and Sakura's relationship it is what the story is about. Like all of Heaven's Feel is about that. But the first part of the story, that's not as clear. And, you know, like it's clear in the game because you understand the the conventions of this kind of game that each of the roots is going to be based around one of the heroines. But at the point in the story that the movie gets to, it's not really been dramatized all that much. You know, you have a couple of conversations with her and she starts, you know, she one of the big divergence points is that she decides to stay at Shido's house. If you remember in Unlimited Blade Works, he makes that offer at one point and she says that she can't and that she's going to start staying more at the Mato house. Um, and she kind of exits the story at that point. Um, and that's one of the big divergences. But th but she doesn't have a lot of material after that point yet in the story. And so creating a bunch of new scenes to be at the beginning, that then makes the couple of important scenes she has with Shiro later in this section of the story have so much more weight for this film because you have set them up. So they kind of become payoffs in some ways to the material that was set up in the prologue of this film rather than more being just purely setups for their relationship as it's structured in the original game. I also think as someone who's just coming from Unlimited Blade Works, the anime, you know, that when that anime starts, which is just the beginning of the visual novel, you have this world for Shiro that is really beautifully lived in of him having mm -hmm. this kind of found family that he lives with. That is, Kiritsugu is gone, but sort of the spirit lives on in this big manner he has. And he has Fujine, who's always coming over, and she's silly, but very caring. And you have Sakura, who is practically like a sister at this point, because she doesn't live, live there, but she is always there. And that is the world he exists in when we meet him. But we don't know how that world came about and where that story goes is is that's more of a story of him leaving that world, you know, Star Wars esque or Hero's Journey esque, and kind of meeting new people and going on a journey outside of those bounds. And so when we pick up here, and it becomes the first twenty minutes of this movie are leading up to that point where we met him, and how did this sort of little family unit come together? And it's very touching, 
And it's, I think, very lovely to just see Sakura latch on to this person, seeing in him things... This is also, I think, important, having seen Unlimited Blade Works, we know what kind of things she sees in Shiro that make her want yes. to latch on to this person. And why he is the kind of person who would reciprocate in that sense. And even though Fujine is, <laughs> understandably at first, is like, why do you have this girl in your house, Shiro? You're not supposed to have this. But she eventually comes around too. And so you see this little familial unit built. And then where the story diverges is it's about him protecting that unit. It is about him yes. deciding, this is what is important to me, and this is what I have to sort of fight to protect. And so I think it really contextualizes where this story is different, while also, I think, doing a good job educating the viewer in, this is an alternate path. This is a sequel, but it is also an alternate route. This is, how did we get to this same point, and at what choices would be made to tell a different story with these pieces? I think it sells that idea in in movie language very well, because, of course, in a visual novel, you just expect that. That's how, that is the language of visual novels, is that you have diverging mm -hmm. paths and alternate routes. Movies and TV shows don't work that way, you know? So you kind of have yeah. to sell that to the viewer as well, and I think starting with 20 minutes or so of material that is completely unique to this film, um, but informs things you saw in the previous show is really smart. Um, and then when it does get to the point where you are overlapping, there's a couple of things they do here that I think are brilliant. There's one major scene that is exactly the same, that is done in the same length and everything in Unlimited Blade Works, and that is where Shiro is at school alone and Shinji makes him go clean the clubhouse. Mm -hmm. And you get that same scene but it is obviously newly animated and it is framed and cut very differently. So you have much more extreme obtuse angles. It's a little slower. It's There's like less sound. It is more stark. And then Hiroshi Kamiya, who might to me be the MVP of this movie. I think it's an incredible mm -hmm. performance. Gives a really different valence to Shinji. Where Shinji was just an almost to the point of comic relief jackass in Unlimited mm -hmm. Blade Works. Uh, to the point where, you know, he doesn't, he's a piece of shit, but he doesn't deserve what happens to him at the end of that show. Just the abject what he goes through because he hasn't done anything that evil in that version of the story. Um, other than maybe some oblique hints that he has done something to Sakura. Uh, but in this, he's much more complexly human, both good and bad. Like, you get a sense in that scene, in Unlimited Blade Works, it feels like he's just bullying Shiro. In this, it feels like he wants Shiro to fight back. Like, he wants yes. a connection with this person. He wants some kind of spark of friendship that we get hints did exist between these two guys. And it feels really sad. And I think it speaks a lot to Hiroshi Kamiya's talent, who is as talented an actor as exists, mm -hmm. that Shinji just comes across as a different person to me here, even though it is the same lines of dialogue, the same scene. But it is just kind of sad. And I think it informs a lot of he is such a pathetic character in this movie, but I think he is pathetic in really human ways, including the violence he inflicts on people, make him much more of, and instead of like, he's a heel in Unlimited Blade Works, he is a much more complex antagonist this time around. And that's the kind of thing where, because they do that same scene again, but with the new Valence, it kind of teaches you how to watch this entire movie of it's the same ideas from a new angle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think Shinji is one of those characters that, as you say, he's he's more of this kind of like bumbling bully in the other roots. And so you kind of get used to him being sort of dispatched, like, right? He feels like he's like the early bad guy you fight and you get rid of him, which does happen here. But obviously, like we know that he's going to stick around to some extent because he's really central to the story. Um, but but yes, because the relationship with Sakura is so important and he is, if the name only, he is her older brother. And like there's, you know, this like very dark relationship between the two of them, this abusive relationship, um, it becomes much more central. And yeah, the, the, the implication of the friendship, which you hear in kind of lines of dialogue in the other roots, but here the way it's portrayed, you feel where it came from. Like you feel that's like, I think Shinji, like probably thought that he was a closer person to Shiro than he actually was um, because Shiro is nice to everybody. Shiro is kind to everybody. He listens to everybody. He tries to help everybody. And, and Shinji is such a pathetic piece of shit who has never been treated nice 
by, you know, like the one thing Shinji wants is like affirmation from his family and stuff. You know, um, like we, you really get to know that pretty well with From Fate Zero, where you know the kind of person that Zoukin is. You know how awful Shinji's life must have been growing up in that fucking house. One, we know that his fucking father was killed by Kiritsugu. Um, because that happens in Fate Zero. Um, it's a character that you probably don't really notice if you didn't know who Shinji is, but like, you know, Shinji has had a shit life. This doesn't excuse the shit he's done, but it means that he hasn't had affirmation from anybody. And so I think you can very clearly see that Shido would have given him that that to him, but in this very superficial way. That is not what Shinji wants. Shinji wants an actual friendship. And so him pushing those boundaries with Emiya, um, and like pushing him to say, like, hey leave the archery club. And he thinks that Shida's going to be like, oh, fuck you. Like, I love archery. Like, this is like, why would I ever leave the archery club? Like, I'm better at it than you are. Um, and instead, Shida just sort of accepts that and says, okay, like, if that's the best thing for everybody, because Shida doesn't love archery. He's very good at it, but he doesn't care about it. Um, and I think, like, Shinji's, like, like Shida's sort of malfunction as a person where he finds it hard to, like, be selfish to really care for things, especially like care for things in spite of other people. He just can't do it. That destroys any relationship he might've had with Shinji and pushes Shinji deeper and deeper into that darker place, um, which I think reflects in interesting ways, his relationship with Sakura, because in some ways that's the exact kind of relationship that Shin Shido had with Sakura, but Sakura grafts onto it and she's a little girl, right? She like, needs that kindness so much. She doesn't want a competitive relationship or even maybe an important relationship. She needs any relationship. And so she grafts onto that thing, that, that simple kindness that Shido reaches out to her with. And that's what creates this like bond where she like needs that from him so bad. Um, I think that's one of the nuances in the, like the human relationship you see, see that starts developing this movie. Yeah. And she, yeah, as you say, Shinji's a piece of shit, but it is a, abuse 101 kind of story right mm -hmm. if he is the the boy in his family who is horrifically abused by the father figure or the grandfather here or the um mess of bugs figure here yes um then he is going to start taking that out on the next person down the totem pole which is sakura right and she is the one who is is in some sense able to from what we've seen so far, break that cycle a little bit by having this this other home she can go to, you know, mm -hmm. this kind of escape. But yeah, it's just, I, I needed to zero in on that scene because I do think it's so interesting. It's, you know, Hiroshi Kamiya, we've talked about before, is one of the greatest actors working in Japan. Uh, you called him the best actor of the 2010s when we did our yep. Anime of the Decade episode. And, you know, it is a very comic performance in Unlimited Blade Works. Like I joked, he's up in like the Penguin from Polar Bear Cafe uh -huh. register at parts of that show. Um, and here it is just so striking what a venomous, quiet, like, it, banal evil performance it is in this one you know there's a couple of moments where he's more of a loud jackass but it's a lot more disquieting because it, it the whole movie is trying to get you to zero in on these these trauma elements you know and I think there's something similar honestly in Sakura's performance where it isn't it isn't chilling in an evil way you don't get a sense that she means anybody harm but there is often something chilling in how she talks because she is devoid of some of the the emotions you expect her to have yeah, one hundred percent. And and thinking about like going back to some of the stuff we talked about, with like the harsh nature of the editing, the scene that you're talking about with Shinji is one of the places where I really noticed just like uh, th how effective that was because that scene is actually introduced to where you know it becomes like um, the afternoon, and so you get this kind of like orange sky, you know, as the sun's starting to set, and you just get this shot of like a um, tower with power lines and it's it, you just hold on that for a couple of seconds and you just get the buzzing of electricity and you have no context for why you're being shown this shot and then you get a shot of Shido who is in the school like which is next to where this, these power lines are like standing outside Sakura's room and that's where Shinji encounters him um, or, or a classroom at the school but that electric buzzing sound in the sound mix maintains it becomes more muffled but it's there throughout the entire scene and that's just like a very sp good example specifically of what the editing does in this movie where it is using the quiet it's using like ambient sound that is like very like tense and upsetting um, and it's using these harsh cuts to like the environment or to characters that kind of spatially disorient you because you don't understand why you're being shown this shot of this power line thing for five seconds and then just cutting back to Shiro. Um, and the whole movie does stuff like that all the time. 
Yeah. I think there's another impressive series of edits here uh, leading into the opening credits where you have, uh, after the conversation with Shinji, we know from having seen the show, Unlimited Blade Works are played the other roots of the game, that what Shiro is going to go do now is like step into, I was going to say a step into his fate, but also step into fate, into the story, right? He's going to go mm-hmm. get killed by Lancer, and then he's going to get revived by Reen, and then he's going to go home, and he's going to have to, there's going to be this second fight with Lancer, and then he's going to summon Saber, blah, 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 right? And so because we know all of that is coming, instead of doing the fast forward effect, they do these cuts to Sakura um, back at Shiro's and then going back to her place. And this you get this these series of cuts of what is going on in her life while these things are happening to Shiro. And that is what, and ultimately it is this cut of her when at the moment where we know Shiro is going to get stabbed by Lancer, that happens to him off screen you cut to Sakura and there's this really striking shot of her looking out at the city uh, as the snow comes down and she's on the top of the hill and she realizes something has happened and then she slowly turns and goes into the mansion as Yuki Kajura's utterly haunting music comes up Mm -hmm. and then we fade out and then we go into the opening credits which is these images that I think are just pulled from the Unlimited Blade Works anime of these things happening and then there's some of the narration by Zoken and there's this just a big choral piece that sounds like you're being you're descending into hell is what I get from that music I found it such a striking opening credit scene that I rewound and just watched it twice in a row because it's so dense how it, it moves you through these images but really puts you in the mindset of Sakura's side of the story as these things are happening, mm-hmm. because that is the point of view that's going to matter most this time around. Yeah, and it also like it sets up something that this movie does incredibly well because it doesn't in that scene, and then later where Shido sees um, Zoken, or I think actually this happens earlier. He he sees Zoken, and Zoken like asks him. Um, yeah, it is earlier because it's before he summoned Saber. Like, if the Einsburn girl is doing well or whatever, realizes that Shido doesn't know jack shit and Zoken, like, recedes back into that garden. Um, And they do such a good job of making the Mato Manor just the most upsetting fucking building you have seen in your goddamn life. Like, I want to see a, like, architect reacts to just, like, look at, like, what is it about that house? Because (laughs) it, it is, like... It is primarily upsetting. I hate looking yes. at it. And they use a bunch of shots that are framed exactly like the way the background from the game is framed if you're, when you're on the street outside looking at the manor with the gate in front of it. And there's just something about the angle and this weird like kind of rotund piece that ha- is like kind of juts out from the middle of the house where these two pieces intersect. Um, and there is something just extremely upsetting about the Mato house and how like foreboding it feels. It reminds me of like, um, that thing, that line from Fate Zero that Irisfeel has about like mages um, headquarters or whatever, they're like laboratories in the space and like how, and then Tosaka has a similar line about like what that reflects of the person, right? Of Tosaka's um, manner, like it's hard for people to get in, but once they get in, they can't get out, which reflects Tosaka's personality. Whereas for Shido, it's this big open house that anyone can just come through. And then like, there's something about the Mato family that it feels like it's the gate to fucking hell. Um, and, and there's something about the way it's designed as a building that does that. And then also the way it's like shot and used in this movie has that effect as well. Like when you see Sakura about to walk into that house, you just desperately want her to fucking run away, go, do not go into that building because it's evil. Yeah. I mean, what it reminded me of is, uh, we will be talking about the witch on the Holy night visual novel, uh, at the end of this season. Um, but there is the, the manner, the, uh, um, Kuonji, Kuonji Manor. Manor, yeah, where where the main action of that uh, novel takes place. This feels like the evil version of that. It feels yes. like like because it's got a similar quality. If you haven't read Witch on the Holy Night, it, you have sort of a city that is down in kind of this valley, and then you have up on the mountain is the Kuonji Manor, and the Kuonji Manor is weird in a couple of ways. Both that it is up removed on this mountain, but it is also literally a Western manor that was taken apart and imported to Japan and rebuilt, so that the architecture is different. There's a similar quality. the The Mato family manor doesn't look like anything else in Fuyuki City, and Fuyuki mm-hmm. City is pretty modern 
modern in Japan, but this is like an old-fashioned Western mansion from like a gothic horror movie. Like it looks like that's where you would go to for Frankenstein to do his experiments or something mm-hmm. in a universal horror movie, right? Because it's it's the kind of house that you can tell has a basement where people are up to no good, right? It's yes. that kind of house. And it's just it's that same feeling of you have to physically go up. It is elevated over the city. Sakura literally can see the whole city when she's standing out on the street. And then you go in and you are removed from the world, literally. Like, it is a it is a different place you are entering into. There is a big fucking gate. You know, Zoken stands behind the gate and needles Shiro. It's so fucked up. Everything about it is horrifying. And yeah, I think, I think horror is the right word. It does feel like, even though this has some absolutely spectacular action, if Unlimited Blade Works is sort of a, a action drama, this feels like a horror movie in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. A, a horror drama. You know, yeah, one hundred percent, yeah. But it's not, you know, it's not horror in the way that there's not jump scares or anything like that. But it is, it has that very tense quality of where it's like pushing you into this incredibly dark place and making you like encounter and think about incredibly dark themes. Um, again, which is very similar tonally, I think, to Kata no Kyokai. You know, if you think about like particularly some of the movies like movie three or movie five or Kata no Kyokai are particularly like horrific yes. in their content and what you kind of like asked to consider and confront um and heaven's feel is in the same tonal space as that yeah and and you know you we're talking about the editing we talked about editing a lot in Kara no Kyokai, particularly with with movie five with the paradox spiral uh and there's a similar this does not have the same kind of out of chronology editing but where the edits often feel like intrusions they feel like you feel the word cut the word cut is a word that is violent right and most movies cut to make cuts feel gentle this is a movie that cuts to make cuts feel violent you know yeah um one thing while we're talking about the beginning of the movie i'm looking at your um so you you have shared some screenshots with me which has become our new habit over the course of the season uh, I, I've learned station. that it is so much easier to go hit three buttons on my computer and take a screenshot that has subtitles on it, than write down a line of dialogue. Uh, and it's easy to share. And I can also take images and it's just, and then we can look at them and it, it's actually, it's stupid, but it's so simple. It works. I don't know why I had, yeah. didn't do this years ago. <laughs> yeah. It is like, it is like weirdly genius in its simplicity, but I laugh because you are sharing a, you have a screenshot in here from the very beginning of the movie that I assume you had the exact same light bulb eureka moment I did, which is um, when at the end of the kind of opening, opening sequence, which is with like middle school age Sakura and that like the butt of the relationship she has with Shido and when she's very dark, um, you know, there's like no light in her eyes and, and through their interactions, she starts to slightly open up and then Shido gives her the key to his house so that she can just let herself in. And then he's coming home from school and and he's able to and he opens the door and just walks in because Sakura is already there and says to Daima right like welcome home like that kind of traditional greeting you know which is counterposed with the first scene in the movie which is him coming home after archery practice and there's nobody there and he's alone he has to unlock the door and when he comes in and she's there he says this line of like if there's anything that's changed is that I found myself rarely using my own key anymore and if you've been going on this journey with us, if you've been doing this the right way, that should make your brain light up on fire and think about movie five from Kata no Kyokai and the key and how important that was as a central symbol of that movie about the key being this thing that separates like the inner life from the outer life and the thing that protects the family is the thing that like Kokto at the end, the ending of that movie is Kokto letting himself into Shiki's apartment, symbolizing like his like ability to just sort of like come into her life and be a natural part of her life. And I, I have no idea if that was like an intentional callback, if that's just a coincidence. I mean, that's not a scene that's in the game. That's not a line that's from the game. Um, these are this is a team of people that worked on all the Kata no Kyokai movies. So I don't know if they did it intentionally, but it was a like, I cannot fucking believe how perfect I um, mean, the key is going is a thing that pops up in Heaven's Feel later as well. So in one of the other movies, it will come up. Um, so like it is related to a thing, a thing from the game, but the specific moment isn't in there. Um, and so I just thought, holy shit, this is so yeah. good. The continuity across our little season of podcasts here to connect these two ideas and two different properties. Well, it's so smart in this movie. I mean, one, I just that line of dialogue is such a Kinokunasu line of dialogue, I think, about, Mm -hmm. you know, that observation of I'm rarely using my own key anymore. 
Um, and it is also the arc of this movie. This movie is so smartly structured where again, even though like on a plot level, is there anything I can point to that is like the thing that like ties the movie together at the end? No, it kind of has an anti-climax. Saber disappears. You know, Shiro crawls home bloody. There is nothing defeated. There is no resolution to these things. But what is the arc of this movie is scene number one. He comes home and he's alone. And then he gains this this relationship that leads to, I found myself really using my own key. And what is the final scene of the movie is him walking home bloody, beaten. But there is Sakura there waiting for him. And he says, Tadaima. And she says, Okairi Nasai. And it's like... Mm -hmm. And everything is, everything's okay, a little bit. Like, everything's off, but also everything's okay, because in this story, he has this person who he can say tadaima to, and she can respond, yes. you know? And that, to me, is what Heaven's Feel Movie 1 is ultimately about, is that those two sides of the coin. Um, and it's the thing that makes the movie, I think, just, it, it, it lands on you like a ton of bricks because of that. Yes, and and you know this is the key. It's such a fucking yes good symbol, and whether it's an intentional callback or not, it is a very good callback for the purposes of this podcast. Like Other as soon as that line <laughs> happened, I smashed the pause button, and I was like, I can't believe it! Oh my god! Like, yes. Holy shit! It's something I would have ne is a connection I never would have made if we had not done this podcast. It's so cool. Other moments from early in the movie I wanted to mention really quick. There's a scene where uh, Fujine uh, gets them to all take a picture together of um, it's it's uh, Shiro and Sakura and then some of the P and then the student council president and the girl from the archery team and she has uh, Soichiro, the assassin dude who we learn yes. we would know from Unlimited Playbooks and stuff is Caster's master. Take the picture and the image of him holding the fucking camera and like having everyone like scoot in and he's dutifully doing it made me laugh. so so hard just knowing who that guy actually is it's yes. great and and food and just the idea of fujine this is her colleague and she just has no idea what his actual life is i yes. love it <laughs> yeah no it's yeah that's it's a really good moment you know like fujimura sensei isn't in the movie a huge amount but every scene she's in continues to be like it's it's she's like that single bright spot of humanity <laughs> that you need in this incredibly dark fucking story you have the scene that she comes in with, like, the Santa outfit on because it's Christmas. That was great. Um, I love all of that. Uh, we get uh, – there's several points in this movie you mentioned earlier where we get what are essentially, like, Shiro's PTSD flashbacks of the night that Fuyuki City was on fire and he was rescued by Kiritsugu. But, of course, last time we saw these images was on TV. Now we're in a movie. And they fucking make it look like that because the images of the city on fire are so viscerally upsetting in this film, especially whenever we cut to the, like, hole that is the Holy Grail up in the sky just belching out the, like, blood and flames. It looked very good in Fate Zero. It looks like... It's so abject and fucked up in this movie. It mm -hmm. kind of it on one level, it looks like the Tower of Sauron in Lord of the Rings, like the yes. eye. It kind of looks like, but of course, it's a reverse thing. This is an eye in the sky belching out what is effectively the body of the tower. Um, but like every time you see it, it just looks so wrong, and it becomes a symbol over the course of the movie. Because like one of the last moments is Saber in that like Nether realm, seeing a similar kind of hole in the sky that is the Holy Grail, and being led towards it. Um, but man, it's it's so striking how powerful those images are. Yeah, and it's particularly it's the way they're used of that, like the sudden cuts to it and how intense it is um, and that the whole aesthetic of it is so sh harsh, right? Because you have the what they were able to do with like um, mod, like digital coloring and some of like the 3D effects around the fires um, just makes those images really stand out. And specifically in your notes, the scene you pull from is one of the, is the first one, I think, where he does this, where the intro into it, I find very striking, where he just lays down and he has the flash. And then he says, oh, it's happening again, or here it comes again. Like, if you realize, it it shows you this, like, it is something he's so used to, this. Um, like, he it's, it's just like this kind of background radiation of his life is every once in a while for no particular reason, he has these flashes to these events that it is still the thing that like so dominates him. And there's something about the way that that's framed of like, it's, it is horrifying, but it's also mundane to him because it's part of his everyday life that I find very striking. Um, and I think it captures 
a tone for that kind of stuff that is very much the way the game does it. Like there's a weird, there's a sad level of acceptance that Shido has around this trauma. Like it horrifies him still, like it drives him. It is like the main thing that defines his life. But he has like come to accept it in this very mundane way that I think is upsetting because you you want him to be happy and you want him to be able to move past this. But he's kind of totally given up on that. Yeah. And it's understandable that this would be like a primal moment. He relives so many times that he would just kind of like the, the best way would be to just to cope with it would be to just let it kind of roll over him. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's very human in that way. One other moment is from that same scene where he meets uh, Zoken at the mansion after he drops off Sakura that one night, there's this moment where what leads into that is he's walking away from the mansion. And then he says, he, you start to hear these chirps and he says, wait, are those bug noises? But it's the middle of winter. And then he goes in and looks in the gate and that's when Zoken comes out. And just as someone who had seen Fate Zero, that is a viscerally upsetting uh -huh. moment when he says, are those bug noises? And you know what that is. It's like, oh, that is so fucked up. That is so yeah. fucked up that he's walking around. You can hear because you know that manor is full of those evil goddamn bugs. Ugh. Yeah. And it's a great trick because it's something like, you know, I mean, it's something in the world in general as well, but also specifically in anime, like that kind of the background noise of cicadas and stuff like that is such a shorthand in anime. Yes. Um, for like the time of the year and it's used symbolically in, in anime all the time or and in other Japanese works um, and so you get like because there are because those noises the chirping is already there in the scene but if you're watching it you don't think about it because you're not thinking about what time of year it is because you're I don't even know if it specifically said that even if you know what it is you're not going to be thinking about it and so it's not until Shido points it out that you're like oh wait that is weird like why in the middle of the night in winter, why are these bugs chirping? And they're like, oh, fuck, it's the Mato Manor. And then Zokin comes out. Um, that creepy old fuck. <laughs> God. He is he is one of the... There are so many good villains in Fate Stay Night. There are so many absolute pieces of shit. Zokin might be the shittiest. Yes. What a goddamn bastard. He's he's definitely, like, the most upsetting and creepiest character. Like, he's just you just don't want to look at him. You don't want to hear his voice. It's like, stay away from me, evil bug man. Um, fuck off. That's like, why I have to say to Zoken, fuck off. You know, Kotomine is an absolute garbage human who has done some of the most evil things we've ever seen, but at least he will look you in the fucking eye and fight you. There's something about Zoken, just he will come around on his fucking sea of bugs and all this stuff, and it's just so messed up. I hate him so mm. much. <laughs> yep. Speaking of Kotomine, we do, after the opening credits, as we get back to the church scene. Um, so, like... What are the sort of specific diversion divergence points here that I guess are in the visual novel as well? Obviously, there is Sakura choosing to stay. There's We have the fight with Berserk where Shiro jumps in. Are those kind of the mm -hmm. points where Heaven's Feel starts to become Heaven's yes. Feel in the visual yeah, novel? Yeah, like, like in general, uh, from what I remember, all three of the roots basically diverge about the point of the church. Um, yeah. Because it, it's, it's specifically like the fight between with Ely and Berserker, that first fight... That always happens in all three of the routes, but it goes a different way each time. And so this one is one where Shido jumps into the middle of it and gets his fucking belly sliced completely open, um, which is a very Shido thing to do. Um, it's just, and you know, this is now because it's a movie, they can actually show the way that it is described in the game because like the violence is described very uh, explicitly in the game. Uh, but they don't really show it, you know, because they're not, not going to make unique art for every single one of those kinds of scenes. So it's just described to you what's happening to him. Um, but yes, that's like that's the divergence point where it is. OK, now you're fully onto the Heaven's Feel route and then on the way back from that, because the timeline has now changed of when he is like coming home is now different because of those events. That's when he encounters Shinji who is attacking Mitsuzuri, or like Ryder is sucking Mitsuzuri's blood for energy in that alleyway, which is a thing that happens in the other routes. You just never see it. That's because if you remember, Mitsuzuri stops coming to school after that point. Um, oh, and that's right. Happened. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, that's really cool. Um, but yeah, this is a, a great series of scenes, obviously. And you talked about him jumping in front of Berserker. My notes just say here, you see his fucking guts fall out. Oh my God, uh -huh. Jesus, all in caps, because it is so upsetting. He like rolls in, they like do this. He gets 
hit and you just see blood spew everywhere and then they cut to the shot of like the road and he rolls into the shot and is just leaving entrails behind as he rolls into the shot it's so bloody it is by far the most graphic image we've seen since Kara no Kyokai which has some similarly graphic images but it is it's also Shiro it's upsetting and so many things are already feeling off that I'm wondering like does he just die here? Like, what is, what the hell is the next step in this story? And of course, then you, and they implicitly remind you of that he has the Excalibur thing inside him because they mm-hmm. show some of that imagery and that's how he's able to heal, obviously. But uh, man, that's fucked up. Yeah, and I love Elia's reaction to it where she's just utterly shocked at the <laughs> incredible stupidity. I yes. mean, we understand why. Like, we understand the psychological profile of Emi Ishido and how, like, he has no other choice. He's going to fucking jump in there. He's a fucking idiot. He kind of tries to do it in Unlimited Blade Works. And he gets stopped by Tosaka. Um, because it's like, this is the dude that he is. He's going to try to jump in there. Um, and so he just rolls to her feet with his guts spilled out on the ground. Um, and she just looks down at him in this like kind of dismissive and disappointed way. On this like, really? Like, that's it? Like, that's all it's going to be? And then, you know... Like, good for thing for Tosaka is that, you know, Ely gets bored and she just leaves. You know, she just takes Berserker yeah. and goes home. It's like, oh, well, I guess that's that. I, you know, clearly she was hoping to have more fun getting to exact her revenge on the son of Kiritsugu, but just didn't, didn't, didn't go that way for her this time. Nope. Uh, I do. That fight is amazing, though. It's a really good... The way they, sh- they, they cut it and everything is you're actually not seeing much of the fight. You're seeing some moments of big blows, and then you keep cutting to Shiro, which makes sense. Because in Unlimited Blade Works, he does not go run into the fight. So it's a little different. Um, but the main thing I noticed here is that just, like, this is true throughout the movie. The sound mix is incredible yes. in this film. And particularly in this scene, when the swords collide, when Saber and Berserk like Berserker like hit their their blades together, you feel it in your fucking gut. Like those blows are so heavy. And it's something that I feel like each fate work we've watched on has done a better job conveying the power of the servants. And I think mm-hmm. Heaven's Field does a better job than any of them. This scene, Lancer's big fight, some of what Assassin is able to do, like, and I think a lot of that is actually down to sound design. It's just like you hear yes. those blows feel like they are close to breaking the sound barrier or something. They're so heavy and fast and it's really impressive yeah no the sound mix in this movie is fucking incredible um yeah and one one thing they do i really love they add that little moment in to when shido hears uh archer and lancer fighting before you know he summons saber and all that stuff happens at the school um like there's this gust of wind that blows past him when he first hears the blow um that i think is a, like a really good touch to add that element um that just be like oh like there's something so otherworldly about these two entities clashing that it's not even just sound like the sound is so loud it is like blowing the air past him with a shockwave basically um and the sound design kind of sells that for all of the servant related fights in the show yeah speaking of uh great fight moments what about saber just whipping Ryder around yes. with her own chain and throwing her into the wall holy oh, shit yeah. that's a moment <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really good. Um, you know, this is a, a scene that I think is even better in the game because in the game, um, like in the fate route, Ryder is like the first really big fight you have and it's like a full big fight. And that's like the first time you see Excalibur get used um, is fighting Ryder. Um, and so there's something very fun about in this context that she, because part of the reason why that's a bigger fight is that she has stolen a lot of magical energy at that point. So she's much more powerful. Whereas Saber encounters her here, right at the beginning of the Holy Grail War, they haven't activated the like the magical crest at the school or whatever that's meant to suck all the life energy out of the students. Um, and, you know, Shinji is a complete piece of shit master who is basically worthless as a mage. He's even more worthless than Shido is, honestly. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, Ryder doesn't stand a fucking chance. She just gets slapped around and thrown around with those chains. That's also where you get the sound design. Like, uh, it reminded me a lot of the modern God of War games that just have yes. those really, like, <laughs> viciously juicy sound effects on the chains. Um, and then that's that moment of where Shinji thinks he's this is his big moment. Finally, he can sort of, like, 
fight Shiro and challenge him on equal footing and all this kind of stuff is like a fight between mages um, with our servants. And then Ryder just gets fucking batted past him and craters into the wall and you just get that shot of utter shock on Shinji's face as he realizes like, oh, like he's nothing, you know, he's he will never be able to be as good a person as Shido. He will like not as a human being nor as a master. He does not hold a candle. Um it's it's a great scene. It's uh it's fucked up. It's great. I love it. What is, so I guess you kind of uh talked about this, but that was kind of going to be my question is what would we know about Ryder going into this version of events because obviously from Unlimited Blade Works, she's effectively not in that. She is killed off screen and mm-hmm. is not a part of that story. So as you said, she's uh, in the first route a little bit more, but uh, yeah. quickly she comes She comes back at the end of this movie, and it's, you start to see some other things going on. I, it seems like she's going to be a bigger character in this version than in the yes. other ones, right? Yeah, this is the, the, the route where Ryder features the most. Like, there are reasons for why she's around and stuff like that um, that we will learn in the next movie. Yeah, in, in terms of like what you would have known about her, you would, I'm not going to say what it is because you haven't seen it yet, but you would know what her noble phantasm is and you would probably know who she is, like what her real identity is also because that happens in the original Fate route. But you don't know what her whole deal is as a character yet, really. That all comes across in the Heaven's Feel route. And in Unlimited Blade Works, yeah, all you get is she has that one little encounter with Shiro where she fucking stabs her chain through Shiro's arm and shit. Um, at the school, and then she gets killed by Kuzuki Sensei off screen. Um, yeah, so we will we will learn a lot more about Ryder in the next two movies. Yeah, awesome. It's uh, it's I'm I'm excited to see more of that character. She is cool. I will say, my my working. Let's just go with Jonathan's working theory, knowing nothing okay. and having not looked up uh, plot spoilers or anything. And I don't know if theory is right because I don't feel that confident in it. But there are to back up. There's a very funny scene after... It's one of the scenes in the movie where Shiro has been home with Sakura. and No, I think what it is is Sakura and Saber leave the room to go set up Saber's bedroom. And then yes. Shiro is alone with uh, Fujine. And Fujine starts kind of ribbing him because now he's got three girls living with him. <laughs> you know, yes. it's, it's Shiro's harem home. And uh, she's ribbing him and she, he's, she says this thing about like... You know, Sakura is an E cup, right? <laughs> and, you know, it's just to embarrass him. And then, of course, but, but she's put that earworm in your head. And then I started noticing, oh, Sakura does have yeah, extremely large breasts in this movie. They're not being shown off or anything, but you can see in the character design, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there is when Ryder comes in at the end of the movie to save Shiro. Uh, one, she is shaving, saving Shiro. Two, she has long purple hair. And three, there is a shot, a big 3D shot where she is jumping through the air with the chains where you see prominently how big her breasts are. And I'm like, oh, she must be related to Sakura in some sense. Like in some sense, I'm like, is she Sakura? Is this like an archer and Shiro situation, but with Sakura? Is there something going on there? So that is where I am at at this point, because also that is a scene where Sakura is home in bed feeling sick. Meanwhile, you've got uh, Ryder out in the world kind of looking like Sakura doing this stuff. So that is, again, not a, like a formulated theory, but that is the thing I have picked up on in the visual language so far. I will I will not comment on anything other than, you know, I think you're you're doing a good job of looking at, at clues. Okay, yes. Because, again, yeah. I, I think that line about uh, uh, Sakura's E-cup breasts was not just there for the joke. I think I'm picking up on things. There we go. Okay. All right. <laughs> character i wanted to mention uh while we're talking about the the church stuff because you have two trips to the church after this scene we were just talking about with Ryder is when shiro goes back uh to take um what's her name the uh archery girl um to get um, healed Mitsuzuri. yeah Mitsuzuri. he gets takes her to get healed and then you have a third scene with kotomine later in the in the restaurant so you have a lot more kotomine kire in this i think he might have more lines in this movie than he did in all of unlimited blade works in his Probably, like, three yeah. or four big scenes yeah mm-hmm. and so one we just get that fucking incredible performance again uh, oh my god i what's the name of that actor um, uh nakata joji nakata joji just there's something about i feel like every actor involved in fate gets better every time they come back to it from yeah. watching these all in a row and he is just 
relishing every word with such abandon. I love it. It's such a delightfully evil performance. And I love Kotomine's role in this because he's not super active in the plot yet. And in fact, is in some ways less active because Lancer is just taken off the board. But you have the, the scene in the beginning where he does the basic exposition. You have the second trip to the church where he does heal Mitsuzuri and he reveals his backstory with Kiritsugu to uh, Shiro. And then you have one of my favorite scenes we've watched for this season of Japanimation Station, which is where he invites Shiro to the restaurant after Lancer has been taken out. And he is eating this like spicy tofu dish. Mm -hmm. And it is, it, I wrote in my notes, this is like his version of the Denethor eats scene in Return of the King, where yes. Denethor, there's this scene in Return of the King where he sends off um, uh, Thar, Thar, Thor, Thor, Faramir. Faramir. <laughs> I was supposed to say Tharamir. That is very wrong. He sends off Faramir to die. And while he's doing that, he's messily eating like tomatoes and chicken and all of this stuff. And it's very upsetting. I feel like this is the same version of that scene where Shiro comes in and he's eating this spicy tofu dish. He is clearly relishing the pain of the spiciness. Yes. And it is so gross. And it is so striking. The, the like level of animation detail on the food itself is so fantastic. And of course, he's talking to Shiro about uh he kind of reveals the thing like yeah i was a very corrupt leader of this game lancer was working for me anyway shiro do you want to work together and shiro being a smart person is like i no, i will not trust you in a thousand years you piece of shit it's hilarious yeah i need to i need to look at the game to because i don't remember if the mabo tofu which is the dish he's eating i don't remember if that's in fate stay night or not because that becomes a meme kind of about the character um later um where where that's like the only thing he will ever eat um because it's so <laughs> spicy that it's like the only you know because he can't feel anything um you know because he's just this like emotionalist sociopath um and so you know he's eating this bombably like fucking spicy dish i don't remember if that is the exactly that obviously a lot of the content of the dialogue is in the game i don't remember if the mama dofu thing is in there but if it is or whatever um it is a good touch like it works so well for the scene one it gives you a little bit of comic relief in what is like a very dour movie that you need a little bit of like tonal variety yes. there um and but even with the comic relief it's still kind of upsetting um there's something about what, how it's shown that it is both funny and gross at the same time um there's that moment where he like takes a bite and then you see like sweat beads start to appear on his cheeks and then he like unzips his like coat or whatever and like pops it up and like smoke and steam starts coming off because yes. it's so hot <laughs> um um but yes but then he's he's telling shiro about lancer being killed and then also like you know he basically gives shiro all the hints he needs to go to the judo temple which is the shadow um whatever the fuck the thing is is underneath that the the lake that is there because that's where lancer gets consumed um and obviously that's also where then saber gets consumed so he sort of lures shiro to go up there by giving him those hints um knowing what kind of person shiro is that he can't forgive anything that is sort of like harvesting off of the people of the city which is what that shadow is doing um it's it's eating those people and putting them into comas and shit like that yeah but it's a great scene. I did. I do have the exact line Shiro says. On his way out, Shiro says, if you want me to be a dinner buddy so badly, it'd have to be over my dead body. And I love that because Kotomine has not done anything to Shiro that would make him not trust him. Like, he's healed Mitsuzuri. He hasn't done anything violent. It's just Shiro is... <laughs> has a good feel for people and yes. he's like no you are bad news i'm not eating with you you have your weird tofu i'm leaving it has to be over my dead body i love that that's such a good shiro moment yeah he also does have a really great line when he's explaining what that shadow has been doing to shiro where he says like if what Ryder has been doing is to gain magic is the equivalent of sucking blood then what that shadow is doing is eating itself um, it's like the concept of eating itself. So it's going right. And as he says that, he takes a big bite out of his thing. That's like, oh, what that shadow is doing is just going around and just like eating the magic of all these people. God, that's great. And and now I am uh, Googling, do they, is there a place in Iowa that makes Mapo tofu? I did find one. I might have to have that and report back for next week. Very good. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll get that for movie two and that'll be my, I will eat something upsettingly spicy while watching Heaven's Feel part two and pretend I'm oh, Kotomine Kire. <laughs>
No. Um, but yeah, I just, as someone who loved Kotomine so much in Fate Zero, I mean, loved as a character, not as a person. I wouldn't want to know him. Uh-huh. Uh, but like, you know, he's not in Unlimited Blade Works that much, which was disappointment is the wrong word because it was right for that story. But I wanted to see more of him. And uh, this movie definitely gave us some primo Kotomine Kire. And I was very happy. Yes. And he will continue to, to be in this story because he's, he's an important Good. character. He's, he's wonderful. He's uh, not as a person. Again, but as a character, love it. Yeah. And then I guess we should talk about, this is around the point in the movie where you get what's going on with the true assassin. So I guess either explain this to me or tell me if we will learn more later and you can't explain it to me. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> um, so, like, I mean, the I don't remember how much of this is explained, but it's not really a, a spoiler to explain the basic mechanics of it. So what Caster summoned with Sasaki Kojiro is not really in like a true servant from the Grail, right? That's why he was summoned like in he because he was summoned by the land effectively. She she was like a catalyst that allowed that holy ground to summon a servant. Um, and so that is why Sasaki Kojiro is tied to that gate. He cannot move from like the stairs that lead up to the gate of that temple. Um, and so he's sort of like was this sort of half summon that took the slot of assassin. Um, but th- because he was not a full summoned um, servant, uh, it, you know, they, you basically see in this movie that Zokin is true assassin's master. So Zokin has summoned his own servant, um, which in order to, you know, be able to exist, the servants must fill in one of the classes. So summoning assassin means that this weird sort of half done summon has to be taken out. So assassin bursts from the chest of uh, Sasaki Kojiro very, very violently and incredibly gory <laughs> because then you just get a, sh- a top down shot um, of him on the Sasaki Kojiro on the ground, basically fucking dissected. You know, his yes. whole chest has exploded outward and you see his guts. And if you thought like the somewhat similar shot in Unlimited Blade Works where Caster does something kind of like that to him was gory, like this takes it up to a whole other fucking level. Yes. I I noticed that. It's like, why in every route does he get his fucking chest open like he's having an autopsy while still alive? It's great. But yes, you have... Okay, so I assumed that he is Zoken's servant, but I don't know if we like literally saw that yet. But it, uh, I guess at the end of the movie, that's confirmed more or less. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this is a... he. This was a... So Zoken was not starting out this Grail War as one of the seven participants, but basically takes his place once Shinji is eliminated, right? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, pretty messed up. Um, But then we do have this uh, sort of... The major servant villain in Unlimited Blade Works was effectively Caster for most of the run until Mm -hmm. um, uh, Gilgamesh steps in. But Gilgamesh isn't really even a servant in that one. So you have all of that. But then in this movie, what's so... Again, what is so upsetting about it is it's not only true assassin bursts out of the chest of the original assassin but then he goes and kills caster who was our villain last time around so you literally yeah. have like fucking going and picking on the the last big bad that's who he kills and then we go on from there that's what feels i think so fucked up about it you know yeah and just everything about that scene they do it so well here of where um caster comes out and i like that she's she's initially dressed in like normal clothes because this is presumably not too long after she's been taken in by the temple so she's like dressed in casual clothing um looking for assassin sees his sword start to disappear and realizes oh god something has happened she runs back to go to soichiro um and then finds um assassin there who has basically cut all the tendons on soichiro's body and is just like what is with this dude like, I cut his arms, and I cut his leg, and I cut his head, and I cut this and that. And it's like, he's still trying to move. What is he? Um, and then he fucking uh, makes Caster stab herself with Rule Breaker by threatening Soichiro to, in order to break the contract that binds Assassin to the land there. So that's why Caster has to stab herself so Assassin is free. Assassin then kills her and then like very casually throws a dagger in, and throws a dagger into Sochiro's head as he leaves and Sochiro dies as well. And then a, the shadow or whatever comes and pulls Caster's body and drags it away because it is it is taking the bodies of these servants and then you later see Zokin using Caster's corpse. Um, right. Yes, and it is incredibly fucked up. 
All of it's super fucked up. <laughs> it is totally weird in the horror realm. This is some Kara no Kyokai shit. Uh, there's also the way true assassin is framed when he bursts out of the chest of assassin is really interesting because he's like bathed in blood and red light. And for a second, I had a very different idea about where this might be going because there's one of the ideas in the like Nasu verse is the whole like red death, the thing that this is in mm. Witch on the Holy Night, yeah. this thing that like the closer you get to true magic is like this death that approaches um and that is not what true assassin is but that is what for a second i was like is this is kind of where we're going that there's like a bigger force coming to kill all these people there is but it's not that it is the the Mm -hmm. shadow thing that is going on um so i guess speaking of that the shadow thing is there uh, that obviously is a mystery that is coming forward is it i guess it's not literally working with assassin yet is it or is it like are they working together um, I'm not going to answer that question. Okay. It's, it's meant to be ambiguous then. Yes. It is yes. mysterious. Okay. Like, what is it? What is its purpose? What are its allegiances? It is obviously like, broadly speaking, related to Zokin and Assassin in some way. Yes. Um, but we don't know how any of those things are connected. Yeah. I don't know if this was just a weird subtitling thing. When, when they first see it, I think it's Tosaka calls it an imaginary number space. Is that right? That's why I, I don't think you would see use number. It's like it's an imaginary space, like because that's okay. where um, it eats the spell that Caster was going to shoot um, in another like very graphically upsetting scene where Caster is summoning this like ball of fire that's so hot that Caster's like zombified corpse's limbs start melting off of it, which is a very upsetting shot. Um, and then yeah, then Zokin sees the shadow, freaks out, says like this thing is impossible. Um, caster fires the fireball at the shadow and the shadow just sort of like consumes it um without anything without any negative effects whatever and that's in tosaka looks at it says it's like it's some sort of imaginary space like that spell has been consumed by some sort of like infinite void inside of this shadow okay yeah the the subtitles must have been weird then for me the the subtitles i was watching for this have a couple of weird things we're going to talk about one of them later around uh-huh. the the latest in the saga of how do we translate segi no mikata uh but anyway for this they they called it an imaginary number space which i was then i was thinking of like the so square root of negative one uh <laughs> and that is what this is and no but it is that the whole thing with the shadow i guess is what so is that what basically people call it the the shadow yes or, yeah okay that's that's the easiest way to refer to it yeah it's so interesting because having read Witch on the Holy Night, it very much feels like some of the ideas in that of how where when Nasu pushes towards something abject or Lovecraftian and like this, he's really good at writing like ideas that they can't put into the visuals because it's almost impossible, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but that, of course, presents an interesting challenge for UFO Table here. And so they do it through like it's this thing that exists in the world that looks so out of place. Like its basic shape is like this, almost like a little like robot kind of thing or something, but it opens to create darkness. And when Shiro gets knocked out, there's this rapid series of cuts of all these sort of abstract images. Um, it's really strikingly done. And I, I, again, I have not read this visual novel, but I can imagine having read some other Nasu stuff, how he would describe this. And it seems like they've done a really interesting job adapting those ideas to the language of film. Yeah, I think they do a, a great job. Some of it is like the sound design that they do like there's a really striking shot near the end of the movie when the shadow appears at Nudo you know, Temple and Emiya sees it. And there's a shot that is just basically the shadow standing there and the sound completely cuts out. Um, and then later the shadow just sort of like disappears um, sort of like within the shot. But as it, as it disappears, it's, it is disguised or covered by Shido, so you don't see how or where it goes. So it just sort of like appears in places. You look at it and it's like, you say, it's just, it's like weirdly out of place. It feels like it's from another dimension. It feels like it is like breaking your brain to sort of make sense of it in the world. And that's exactly the way that it's described. It is very Lovecraftian in the visual novel. Yeah, it's really cool. And uh, obviously this all comes together at the end of the movie before like just going through some of the big action beats. Of course, the standout in this movie, I'm curious if you agree, is when Lancer fights Assassin. Oh, yeah. 
I think that is maybe the best action sequence we've discussed this entire season. Mm -hmm. Uh, Give or take how you define certain things in Kara no Kyokai, which I don't think of as action, but are conceptually very high. This is just a big fucking fight. I love that it starts at the shipyard where we had the first big fight in Fate Zero. I thought that was a nice little touch, kind of go back to that location. And then Lancer on the freeway. One thing that's cool there is that is like a visual callback. There's a scene of him doing this on the freeway in the theme song for Unlimited Blade Works. And I know that because it's a shot in our season two theme song of Japan Animation Station because it looks so good. But he literally does that where he's like skating on the air on the freeway as he's chasing Assassin around. You have them fighting on this big truck full of cars. The cars look so real, I don't know how they did it. It's, it's uh, other than, they're not photographs. They are animation, but they are so close to being real. It's crazy. Uh, and just the, the, the intensity of the animation in this scene and the amount of movement and the amount of impact and the viscerally upsetting way it ends with Lancer getting his heart ripped out. God, it is it's such an arresting action sequence. It's, yeah, it's amazing. Um, everything about it, just like the speed, the frosty of it. This is also where you get like that sound design um, which they also do, were really good with in limited blade works with um, Cuckoo Lane or Lancer's spear. And I think that they take to the next level here that you, it's like they use the sonic space possible for the spear in a way that's very different with the swords because there's like you get that sense of it being this metal pole that has like a kind of a resonance to it that's a much like kind of deeper sound because of how like thick it is so when he like kicks it up or spins it around it is a much like kind of richer tone that it makes that it's very satisfying um and yeah there's so many great shots like i love there's the moment when they're on the back of the car um or the big truck that has all the other cars on it that lancer um, just starts spinning his spear around incredibly fast and cuts the whole top of the car off um, to kind of clear the playing field. There's the great moment where um, Assassin is try- throws the series of daggers um, at Lancer that then are covered or colored black so that they like hide in the shadows and they bounce off these pillars, but it doesn't kill Cuckoo Lane because he has a like protection from the spirits from projectiles. Um, so like no projectiles can kill him. Uh, and then, then yes, you get the great ending where Assassin uses his noble phantasm Zabania, um, his cursed arm, where he is able to like destroy Lancer's heart uh, and just kills Lancer instantly. And I think that's one of the things that's very like upsetting about the scene is just seeing him. He's just fucking dead. Like as soon as it happens, like you know, there's a, he gets one little line that's like a narration piece as he gets pulled in. Where it's like he just says like ah shit <laughs> like this is the worst thing that could have possibly happened basically yeah, he says, this this went as poorly as it possibly could have and it is it's so upsetting one because Lancer is such a great character we love yeah. him from Unlimited Blade Works I assume he did cool stuff in the Fate route as well mm-hmm. um, and you want to see more with him at least he got a great fight before he went out you know C- yeah. Caster didn't get to do anything cool before she died in this one um, so he got a cool fight but then it is that it's like that. It's that, as you say, the arm just comes in and like traces around his heart. And even though he is summoning Gay Bull, he's going to do his big, you know, fucking uh, noble phantasm. In the middle of that, his body just, he's dead. It just gives out and he is sucked in by the shadow. Oh, man. It's uh, it's traumatic. And it's like, you don't know how to feel coming out of this because it's like you get... The movie just gets you high on the fucking kineticism of this immense action sequence. And then the way it ends is so upsetting and and like powerfully anticlimactic. I think sometimes we say anticlimactic is, is usually like a derivative or like a derogatory, but it can be used intentionally. And it is an intentional like he is getting ready to do this big cool thing we know he can do and then is just dead and sucked into a shadow. Yeah, and it's just, you know, as soon as it happens to him, the life goes out of his eyes. He doesn't move. He can't talk. And then he's just pulled in and gets his his one little sign-off line as he gets pulled into the muck uh, beneath the lake. Um, and the, and thus completes what is another meme, if you ever watch any of, like, the spinoffs and stuff that are the more comedic things, which is Lancer is. Lancer dies pretty horribly in all three of the roots. You know, he <laughs> dies pretty horribly in Limited Blade Works where he's made to fucking stab himself in the heart. Here he gets his heart killed. Um, if you ever, I'll let you discover how he dies in the first route if you ever play the game. Um, oh, on Fate but, Zero, it's a different Lancer, but that's yes. the one who is made to stab himself when we learn, like, Kiritsugu's full backstory. 
Yes, and so, you know, it's just, it's a bad to be Lancers, you know? You just don't want to be Lancer. He always fucking dies. Um, and it's just, like, kind of a running joke in all the, the spells. It's just, like, Lancer's just, he, he just doesn't have a lot of luck, you know? He just, no. it always goes bad for him. Maybe we can get a spinoff at some point where Lancer uh, wins. Maybe not the Holy Grail War, but some other contest we can have Lancer win. They just, like, just make a movie called Lancer Lives. Um, yes. I'd, I'd go watch that. <laughs> it's great. Um... And then the whole idea, of course, of this force, this shadow, there's a whole part of it we don't know what it is that is under the water. The water itself is like now an evil force in Fuyuki City, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, yeah. and specifically, it, it is this lake behind Yudo Temple, right. right? Which we also know is one of the like holy spots in the city because there are three spots where the there are these sort of like sacred ground where the Holy Grail can be summoned and the Rudo Temple is one of them because that's where the climax of Unlimited Blade Works was. Right. So it's that's what I noticed is we're going back to this place we saw at the end of Unlimited Blade Works and it almost looks like the Holy Grail coming into existence there, but I don't know if that's what... It, obviously, it's supposed to be a mystery, so you're not going to tell me, but yeah. there is some weird shit going on there. And of course, Shiro decides that that's where he needs to go back to at the end of the movie, which is a bad choice on his part. Uh, because it ends extremely poorly. Yes. Um, and this is where it's, you know, it's upset. It's a, This is where it's upsetting that we haven't gotten the really nice movie or whatever that adapts the fate route for Saber. Because Saber gets taken out, um, which is one of the other, like, big, what the, f- what the fuck is happening in this story moments in the game, as well as in the movie. Um, and Because, like in the game, she gets taken out, and this is, like, a big anticlimax as well, right? Like, it is not a big fight that happens. She is... Um, fighting assassin and then gets grabbed and pulled in by the shadow um, and it pulls her under the the lake and then that is that is well we get one scene where she confronts a like evil looking version of her um, but other than that like that is the last we see of her in this movie yeah I mean I I'm not entirely sure what happened and I think you're meant to be at least at this point in the story not entirely sure right um, because she is fighting assassin she is clearly about to get the upper hand it seems like she's just going to use Excalibur to like throw off what he's throwing at her uh and then she is she disappears she's sucked in and we do have this it's the penultimate scene of the movie after you get this little montage kind of checking in on everyone where is where are all the players then we go to Saber in this like it's it's like she's underwater it's like she's in this liminal space it's like she's ready to kind of like let go and die and then she sees this like the eye of the grail and is going towards it and then it's pulled back by this evil shadow um, and I don't know what will happen beyond that um, but clearly she is not a part of this world anymore because Shiro does not have the command sigils yes. anymore but uh, other than that it is yeah it's 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 Again, it's an intentional anticlimax, but it's also a mystery and a cliffhanger mm-hmm. because it's like she's what ha- there's no resolution. She wasn't defeated in battle. We didn't see anything, right? And meanwhile, yeah. Shiro went and tried to fight Zoken. Did actually a better job than I think I would have expected of Shiro at this point with his powers. He does fight off the bugs pretty well, uh, but then he does need um, uh, Ryder to come in and save him. And Ryder, very cool, does a much better job than she did with Shinji as her master because uh, yes. <laughs> she failed pretty hard there. But here, those that that whip thing. That must also be like low key a reason why this had to be a movie is Ryder's fucking weapon in this would be so hard to do on a TV budget. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's there's so true. much movement. There's so much 3D work going on there. It's really impressive. Yeah, it's a, it's a short fight between her and Assassin, but it's a really good one, and it is very yes. satisfying to see like Ryder get to do something cool because it's like she's just been sort of like pushed around so far, and Unlimited Blade works in in the first part of this movie. I'm um, seeing her get a jump into action, and she's like. I'm far more powerful here. And she's also a very good match for Assassin because she's a similar kind of fighter, right? She's very agile. She's very tricky. Um, you know, you also get here, like, because you say, like, you know, Shiro did a bigger, better job than you'd expect, which is true. You know, he he does okay, well enough. He also gets partially eaten by the bugs. Yes. Which is very <laughs> upset. Like, that's like there's lots of things. I feel like we've used the word upsetting a lot on this podcast, but it's a very appropriate word for this movie. Because, it's, you know, you don't want to see your, your boy just get started eating by the eaten by these evil fucking bugs. Uh, and it's particularly worse because he no longer has a contract with Saber. The command seals are gone. So it's like... 
you know, he gets a low level of healing stuff from Avalon being inside of him, but he's sort of, I could get my stomach ripped open and my guts strewn about the place and still get up and start running around a couple of hours later. He can't do that anymore. Like, you know, he's still bleeding and suffering on his way back home. So it's like the injuries he suffers, um, while they are not as severe as what happened with Berserker, they are more permanent than what happened with Berserker. They are like more real feeling. Yes. Yeah. So... There's a couple scenes I want to double back on, particularly with Sakura here, and, and get mm-hmm. into some of that stuff. But are there any other things sort of in the main plot of the movie with the Holy Grail War that we should be picking up on as we head into movie two? No, I think we touched on most of it. Like I said, like really, when you know what the full plot is and you look back at this movie, it doesn't get very far into the main plot because it is most it's mostly like setting up a lot of the mysteries we need to figure out. Right. Like what is Zokin doing? Like what is his deal and what is the deal with Assassin? What is the shadow? And what is its deal? Like what's going on with Sakura? Like why is she like falling sick and seemingly suffering back at Emiya's house? What is going on with Ryder? What is her whole deal? By extension, what is Shinji's whole deal? Like how can Ryder be around if she seemingly doesn't have a contract with Shinji anymore? Um, there's like, it, like what's going to, what's happening with Saber? Where is, what is her whole stuff? Like all of these are just questions that this movie introduces. Um, so it, it is, it's interesting to me how little into the main plot this movie gets while still being able to feel like a complete satisfying story unto itself. That's really what I, I want to praise here because yeah. when I got to, so I was so involved in this movie. It's so good. I did not have a real sense of how much time had passed. And so you get past the scene, the big fight at the Ryudo temple, and Saber has disappeared and all of that. And then you get this little, the music kicks in and you get this little montage that clearly is like the movie's about to end, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, wait, the movie's about to end. And I look, I brought up the timeline and we were later into the movie than I thought we were. We were like at 110 minutes and it's a 120 minute movie. So clearly we're about to go to credits. And it took me aback because I really thought there would be some plot beat or revelation that would like move us out of the question phase a little bit instead of kind of mystery 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 i thought surely this movie must give us something before we jump into film two and it doesn't and i was taken aback by this but then you get the actual ending of the movie is him is shiro bloody half eaten by the bugs stumbling home the snow is coming down and really the ending of the movie is him saying tadaima and her saying, okay, oh, Nasai, and like, you know, I'm home, welcome back. And that kind of put it all into place for me because I think it's such a beautiful, perfect ending of you have had this constant mind fuck of a movie. You've had a million cliffhangers. Absolutely nothing makes sense. But he walks home bloody and and there she is and there he is. And that's that's enough in the moment. And that it kind of just what it is about is the bond. It clarifies for you what was the most important thing in this movie. You are in this ocean of confusion, but there is this life raft to hang on to. And for them, it is each other. And for the audience, it is that bond. And I went from kind of being taken aback that the movie was about to end to going, this is the this is a perfect ending. This is amazing mm-hmm. how good an ending this is. Do you know what I mean? Yes, a- absolutely. Like I, I kind of felt the same way because I had forgotten exactly how far the first movie went. Um, so I was also surprised when we were getting close to the end. It's like, oh, okay, so this scene doesn't happen in this movie, and that scene doesn't happen in this movie. Like, there are lots of things I thought were the scenes that happened in the first movie that actually are scenes from the second movie. Um, but similarly, when I got to the end with Sakura and that scene, it does sort of clarify and put into perspective, like, this is what this part of the story is. Like, it is about this relationship, and it's about coming to understand this relationship as it exists, but also, I think, knowing that it can't be like this forever, that it is going to have to, to change, um, that there's an uncertainty there, right? I mean, because Sakura is also, because one thing that's different about it at the end versus the similar scene you saw at the beginning is Sakura is standing out there in the cold, like you see her hands and her feet have turned red because she's standing out there in the snow um, and she is returning home, home bloodied. And that there's something there's something insecure about the relationship, even as it's sort yes. of reaffirmed there, that you know that things are changing, um, that they're going to have to face whatever everything that is happening now. Incredible character animation there, too, on both of them. Um, the way Shiro scrunches up his face when he says Tadaima mm-hmm. is like, uh, just because we're so used to looking at this face. 
and it feels like now it's making a motion of 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 emotion that is like hard to fat. It's like the, he's he's contorting his face in a way we haven't seen before, and it tells you how different this relationship with with Sakura is. And then of course the actual final beat of the movie is this pan up and Shiro narrating to himself, "Tell me, Kuritsugu, what do I have to do to become a hero? What do I have to do to become a Seigi no Mikata?" And I found that very moving too, because it's exactly what you said. It is these two people are a life raft for each other in the storm that is this movie, that is this confusing and messy plot. But then it is also something has to change, something has to give, and him looking up and being like, what the hell does it even mean at this point? And I feel like it's also pushing us to, this is the next step in the story. This is, it feels like we are pushing past whatever answers Unlimited Blade Works gave us to this question or yes. could give us to this question because things are so scrambled here that whatever approach we took that time, whatever Archer had come to think of all of this, whatever Shiro got out of the uh, you know confrontation with Archer in that version of the story, that's not going to fly this time. And I feel like there is this like desperate, like, what the hell does this term even mean to me now? And it, I think, also indicates to us that where we're heading with Heaven's Feel is a very different evolution of that question than we saw last time. Yeah, because in particular with Shiro now, like, one thing he was able to lean on a lot in Unlimited Blade Works to help him answer that question was that he was a master and he was commanding Saber and he would have this fight. He doesn't have that anymore, right? Like, obviously, he can still choose to, you know, similarly to the midpoint of Unlimited Blade Works where... You know, it's a broadly similar series of events, though far less like sort of dire feeling necessarily where Caster takes control of the contract with Saber. But Saber is still like, you know where Saber is. She's out there in the world. And obviously that whole situation resolves there in Unlimited Blade Works. Um, but here it's like he's taken out of that game. What does he do? Like, does he still fight this fight? What would it mean to try to fight that fight? Um, and, it, and it happening so much earlier in the story here. He's not committed at all to the Holy Grail War in the way he was in Unlimited Blade Works. And I think that's one of the things that makes the ending of this movie feel like you're so lost, is that he's taken out of the game before he's even really started playing it yet. So what does he do from here? Um, how do you tell a story from here? What kind of things can motivate this character at this point? Um, are all things, you know, left hanging at the end of this movie? Yeah. So... But uh, when I saw that scene on my version of the subtitles, it uh -huh. didn't say, how do I become a hero? It said, and, and I'm watching, a. this is a fan subbed version, uh, but it's, the way they translated it was superhero. So it's, <laughs> tell me, Kuritsugu, what do I have to do to become a superhero? And that is the ending to this moody, dark, contemplative movie is him imagining himself as a superhero. Uh, which may be a failure of translation because a uh, superhero makes me think of Shiro strapping on some tights and flying over Fuyuki City. But at the same time, we've been encountering this problem this entire season, Sean, because Seigi yes. no Mikata literally translates as champion of justice, basically, right? Or ally of justice would be the most plain way to okay. translate it. Ally of Justice. Uh, we have seen it subtitled in the, in the different versions I have seen going between official and fan subs. I have seen it subtitled as Hero. Champion of Justice, Hero of Justice, or now Superhero. Superhero mm -hmm. is definitely the funniest. That is the funniest throughout all of Heaven's Feel of every time this is a very serious contemplative movie. And then he's talking about becoming a superhero. At the same time, I do understand what would lead you to translate it as superhero. Because it is, it is an elevated form of heroism he's talking about. I do think superhero is misleading to the average viewer because yes. it is like the 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 connection an English speaker would have to that word is different than what a Japanese speaker would have to Seigi no Mikata. They would not hear that and think of Iron Man uh, yeah. the way we would, right? And so that's why it is silly. But it is also hilarious. I, I think I have definitely landed on it. It's just translated as hero. That is the thing yes. that an English speaker will understand best. If the end of the movie is, how do I become a hero? That makes sense. If it's how do I become a superhero, then it's like, well, you're going to have to find a vat of toxic chemicals, kid, because that's yeah, how most like, of them. <laughs> is there an irradiated spider around here somewhere you can get bit by? Um, you know, yeah, like it is it is something where you, you made a tweet about this and I tweeted back to you that like the thing that the hilarious thing about using superhero to translate this term is it it simultaneously feels like it is the best and worst option, like because it is. <laughs> I think, like, 
if you take the specific cultural, like the very specific cultural associations out of it, like they feel like Seiji no Mikata and superhero feel like they occupy similar linguistic terms in either language. So it's like, okay, yeah, it's this sort of fanciful version of heroism that's maybe has a fairly childish connotation in a lot of ways. Like, okay, and it's associated with lots of media. Like, okay. But the problem is that they're both associated with such specific cultural pieces of media and stuff that while the relative positions are similar in either culture, the specificity of the term is so extreme in either end that it is they can't be really used interchangeably. I think they can only be used interchangeably in a conceptual or philosophical sense, but not in a translating a piece of dialogue sense, because it does just make you think of Spider-Man swinging around Fuyuki City or something, and it is incredibly funny. Um, whereas, you know, there while there is a childishness to him saying, I want to be a Segi no Mikata, it, it, isn't, it isn't like worldview breaking because it's not reaching outside of the Japanese culture to reach for a like a comic book superhero term or something to bring in here. Um, and so it is just like, I understand why you would go to superhero because it does feel like it captures some of the things that Segi no Mikata does. The problem is that the thing, the the other things, the unintended things that it invokes are so overwhelmingly powerful that for the word superhero, you can't use it. So yes, I think Seiya no Mikata in the context of fate is a thorny term to translate. You should just use hero. It is by far the easiest, simplest, most straightforward. Does it capture every single nuance in translation? No. Is it very readable and easy to understand? Yes. And that is how it should be translated. Because like, I think when you bring the word justice in, you also throw people off because then... Yes. Because you would, you, then you expect, I think as an English speaker, Shiro to be engaging more with the question of what justice is, but that is not a theme here. That is not mm -hmm. part of it. It is more about the hero is the important thing. And, and taken together, while none of the words in Segi no Mikata translate directly to hero, they imply heroism. That is what it is to be an ally of justice. And so hero is the best word. Superhero is both the best and the worst. Uh, but when you end the movie by him saying, how do I become a superhero? I expect the ending to be you have the credits and then he and Sakura go inside and expect to see Fujine. And instead, Nick Fury is waiting in, you know, to invite yes. him into the Avengers initiative. And uh, I would watch that. I would watch the shit out of Shiro Emiya joins the Avengers initiative and uses his unlimited blade works to defeat Thanos. That'd be great. Um, oh my God. But... <laughs> Thanos Why? wouldn't have stood a chance. Can you imagine if, like, he's about to do the snap and instead Shiro just puts him in the reality marble and just throws swords at him? Thanos is fucked. Little bitch next to Shiro. How would... I wonder how the reality stone would interact with reality marbles. That's, uh... That's, oh, uh, that's true. That's a, that's a fan fiction question to deal with. <laughs> All right. Someone get on that. Uh, but to double back, there are a couple of key scenes with Sakura mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about before we go today. One of which being, there's this moment where, uh, and there's a similar thing in Unlimited Blade Works, but it doesn't go this far, where, uh, and it's because Sakura is now living with Shiro, he notices the bruise on her, that he has been, she has yes. been hit by Shinji. There is a unbelievably striking piece of animation here where Shiro um, goes back to school and is walking through the hallway after seeing that. And there's this fantastic use of CGI to create this momentum to his walk cycle as he is going through the space. Just, it is like he is barreling through it. And it winds up, this is the same moment in Unlimited Blade Works where he goes to school nonchalantly and Reen is like, what the fuck, you idiot? Why are you here? And they get in this big fight, right? And instead in this version, Reen gets in the way and he's just like, I'm I'm here because of you know Sakura basically, and he he says this and like disarms Reen and goes straight to asking for her help, um, and I thought that was tremendous. And then it is there's a callback to it when Shinji comes to the house and is accosting Sakura, and he walks and just the way like it, it the visuals translate this sense of just raw fury as I think any of us would have in that situation yes. towards Shinji. Um, it's very powerful. Yeah, it's powerful because it's also, it's a thing we haven't seen Shido quite like this. It's one of the things that makes Sakura's relationship with him different is that like, it. I think it hits something more core to him that kind of yeah. gets past some of the kind of like malaise of apathy he has in his life where it's like, he he's not angry because it's triggered his whole, you know, I'm fighting for righteousness and I want to be a hero and all that kind of stuff. It's like, 
he's angry because he really cares about Sakata and he wants to protect her specifically. Right? There's and nothing kinda, abstract about it. There's no like, yeah. does this, will punching Shinji fulfill my Segi no Mikata? No, it's you hit my friend, you piece yeah. of shit. Yeah, and it triggers like this very deeply human reaction in Shido that we haven't seen from him before. Um, and and it's one of those, yeah, I think it's like a key moment that's setting up how his relationship with Sakata is so different than the kind of relationship he had with Tosaka in Unlimited Blade Works and what it brings out in him as a person. Yeah, it's it's tremendous. I, I love that moment. And it's, you know, it also tells you like how different, you know, he would he would obviously fight for Tosaka Rin if she was hurt, but it would be very different because he knows full well Tosaka can take care of herself yes. and she is more powerful than he is. For all he knows, Sakura is not a mage is has is very traumatized and it, it, this isn't like a patriarchal thing it's just it's like he knows that like if she's being beat up he should go help her it's a very different thing um yeah because he's also he's her like right he's her, he's her senpai. senpai yes that's there the is thing. this yeah there's this kind of protective relationship and like and sakura like is very insistent upon she always calls him senpai right it's like a yeah. very specific uh, form of dress that she always chooses to use for him and it, it like sort of defines the power relationship between the two of them. Like he's older, he's taught her since she was like very young at this point, right? Since she was in middle school. Um, and so he does have this sort of like familial older brother-esque kind of relationship with her where that like position of power or whatever means that he feels this a protectiveness for her that's very powerful. Yeah. And I think that scene just like the second scene where Shinji comes to the house and is trying to get Sakura to come back with him, and Shiro goes to slug him. I, I, there's something about, like, how raw the trauma feels in that moment of, like, this is just... There's no fantasy going on here. This mm-hmm. is just a situation of domestic abuse that you are seeing. Um, and I think the way Hiroshi Kamiya plays it, the way everyone plays it in that scene, is is uh, deeply upsetting on a, on a very primal level because of that. Uh, and I think it's done in in the ways other serious topics have been broached in Nasu's work, like sexual assault uh, and suicide. I think it's also done very respectfully and thoughtfully. Yeah, and and it's the fact that like Shido is kind of powerless in the face of it, right? Like, there's nothing he can do to fix that relationship. There, he can't punch Shinji and make it all better. Like, he can't protect Sakura like with a wave of a magic wand or whatever. Like, the relationship and what's happening here is too complex for him to just sort of like superhero his way through it. Um, and he kind of realizes that or sees that or has to confront that fact there that he like, he wants to protect Sakura, but he doesn't really know how to do that with, because it's, she's not just being attacked by a bad guy. It's her brother. It's the, like how she lives in. It's how she's been raised. And it's like the effects it's had on her and her psychology, her whole life. How do you fix that? Um, yeah. that's the thing that he's struggling with. And punching Shinji would feel very good, but it won't solve that problem. It yes, won't exactly. fix her. Even if you could snap your fingers and make Shinji disappear, it wouldn't solve her pain. It wouldn't solve mm-hmm. the trauma. You know, what he can really do is be there for her, as we see in, in another scene I want to talk about in a second. But yeah, it, it very much feels to me, having seen one third of this work, that where Heaven's Feel is going is to push Shiro into circumstances where the reductive framework of being a hero, of being a Segi no Mikata, just is not enough. It is not mm-hmm. a thing that encompasses the scenarios he is encountering, you know? Because there is no real way to be a hero for someone in Sakura's situation through things we typically think of as heroism. You know, the yeah. the most heroic thing Shiro does in this movie is the other scene I think we need to talk about, which is when he is in his garage doing the, or the shed, doing his trace on exercises and Sakura comes out and he pulls out the heater that he's fixed and they just sit and talk. And there's a really beautiful, there's a lot of layers to this scene, but that's the, that's the greatest heroism he has to offer this person, right? Is to be the, the friend and the companion and the person he, she can talk to. And as we get to in that scene, the whole thing about if I ever did something bad, would you forgive me? And him saying, no, I'd get mad at you. I'd be the first in line to yell at you. And how much that mm-hmm. means to her that, that that is a sign of true like friendship. Yeah, and real trust, yes. Um, there's, a, there's a lot going on in that scene. Like one thing I think, because yes, because that line is really important, like so important that it actually, it appears in the lyrics of the, the end of credits the song. song. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's important to sort of set up the dynamic of that relationship and the the level to which she, you know, like trusts her, but also that she trusts him. But something else that's going on there in that scene that's like very good visual storytelling, that's like just good movie making is, um, you know, that he, they're using that heater, which is a heater that we've seen, we saw him trying to fix earlier in the movie. Um, and it's, he seemingly fixed it now and they talk about it and he says he fixed it and they turn it on and they're sitting here and there and having most of the conversation warmed by the light of that heater. And then eventually the heater goes out and then that's when they have that conversation in the dark. Um, and then she leaves and she looks at the heater and tries to figure out like what's going on? Like, why is it broken? Um, and I think yes. there's something in that, that symbolic storytelling, right? Of like, Shido is a person who's like... He tries to fix things. It's what his ability allows him to do, um, particularly like at this point, his development before he knows about Unlimited Blade Works and stuff like that and where some of these powers actually originate from. What he tries to use his magic for is to fix things and he uses it to understand how is it built. He analyzes the composition of it and how all the working parts of it function and then he can take it apart. He can enhance the pieces using his magic, put it back together and it's fixed. Um, the, but he can't do that with people, right? That's the, he, and like, he really can't do it with people because other people maybe could like if Tosaka Reen, if she was had like maintained her sisterly relationship with Sakura, she's the kind of person she could probably really help Sakura here. She could probably like help make that first step to really start solving these problems because Reen understands people. She understands how they work. She understands how to help them because she's, intuitive in that way like shido is a bizarre person so she doesn't know how to help shido because he's fucking you know he's way out there um and she really struggles with shido with sakura i think if tosaka was in this scenario if she was in the place that shido was in she would be able to do a lot more for her but shido doesn't know how to like see those problems or fix those problems yet he his magic can't work here um and it's like he cannot fix her and then that's represented symbolically through the fact that he hasn't really fixed this stove pipe thing either um that it isn't perfectly fixed and so it's like he's trying to figure out how to do this but he just can't quite get there yet yeah and again if there is a uh, a heroism in just being there for sakura again heroism is not enough that's not yes the thing that's there is this is not a magical solution but you're right it is a beautiful piece of symbolism i like during the part of the conversation where the fire is bright and the heater is working you have this interesting connection where Sakura asks about Shiro being adopted and Shiro yes. talks about his relationship with Kiritsugu. And of course, this is another way they are sort of trauma bonding is uh, Sakura. We don't know this. Well, we know this if we've watched Fate Zero. Would we know this in the visual novel yet? No, no, no. Okay. You would not at this point know anything about her being the sister any, like any of that stuff. Like all you would know about her is this is the nice Kohai girl who's okay. very cute that stays over at Shiro's place. That's it. Right. In the in the UFO table continuity, though, we do know this, and it feels like this scene is framed with that knowledge, at least the way it's like animated and cut, Yeah, mm -hmm. um, is part of why she is asking this, and part of why she and, I think, Shiro get each other to a certain extent, is they are both adopted. They are both in families that they did not, were not born into. One thing I really like there seeing is that Shiro does not have any hang-ups about that. Shiro has hang-ups about a lot of things. <laughs> Shiro is fucked up in a dozen different ways. That is not like a, a, obviously there's trauma over what happened in the fire, but what happened with him being adopted by Kiritsugu and, and having Fujine there and all that, that really is like a good in his life. I like seeing that, that that is like something that is a, because even when he hears about Kiritsugu being an assassin from Kotomine, that doesn't shake his faith in him because he knew who this guy yeah. was when he knew him. And I, I yeah, like all of that. He has a beautiful, a beautiful touch they add for this movie of is that when he hears that information, he has this flash to being a little kid on Kiritsugu's back and him yeah. carrying him like after a festival or something is kind of what it feels like the scene implies. And like yeah. he, he thinks back to this, a childhood memory with Kiritsugu that I think is a callback to one of the endings of um, Fate C and I Unlimited Blade Works, where you see them in a similar kind of scene. Yes. Um, and yeah, so you're right. Like, it is, it, for Shido, he has this real trust of Kiritsugu and that this family, as Sakura said, like, the people around him must have been kind, um, you know, which is the big difference in their two experiences. Um, although I like Shido's response is that all the adults in his life were unreliable, and so that's why he... <laughs> 
can cook and clean and he does all the household chores and stuff, right? Better than Sakura can do it, right? He's got like the, you know, all that stuff on lock, the sort of like stereotypically kind of like feminine um, house care kind of stuff um, that you wouldn't necessarily expect someone at like a boy Shiro's age to know how to do, but he's like amazing at all of it. Um, and so she's learning all that stuff from him, which is a good touch um, in their relationship. Uh, but, but, you know, I think that's one of those places where Shido doesn't quite identify that her saying this, her saying all the people around you must have been really kind. He doesn't catch on to what she's saying is the people around her weren't like, he's not right. really catching on to like her experiences. Um, I mean, one, he does obviously he doesn't really identify that he doesn't know that she's adopted. Um, as far as he knows that she's just a daughter of the Mato family. But so he's not picking up on any of those kinds of cues she's leaving out about where her insecurities are. Um, and he's just sort of answering all of her questions pretty straightforwardly. Yeah. But it's a really beautiful scene. And I really do like, I like Shiro is self-aware of how lucky he was to yes. be adopted by Kiritsugu. Like there is a, he is not self-aware enough to, to be, to kind of pick up on what Sakura is saying, but there is this like, for, for, how horrific a event happened to him with the fire and everything. What happened after that was an, an an unalloyed good in his life. And I think that's a cool thing to have this moment reflecting on that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And then you also then get that other key moment that I appreciate. This is this scene where she talks about the, um, like the, the seeing him do the high jump, right? Um, yes. And it's the, the same memory that if we're having watched unlimited blade works. And again, this, you would know this from the game, continuity as well you know that tosaka has the same memory right that she also saw shido that day or maybe it was another day um but of him in the courtyard in middle school or whatever doing this high jump over and over and over again and always failing it that's the moment that she saw him and she has this very cute line where she says like i've known about you since that day senpai um but there's also i think a little detail they add here that is something you don't get in Tosaka's dream that, that Shiro sees is that Shiro never makes that high jump, right? Yes. She mentions like she saw him do it over and over and over again until eventually that boy realized he couldn't do it and he put the stuff away and he walked home. And there's like that little, there's this kind of more cynical edge to the end of that moment that you don't get in Tosaka's version of it, that Shiro wasn't able to do it. Whereas I think in Tosaka's version, you get this idealized version where you don't know if he ever made the high jump, but you like to think that he did. That like because he tried so hard, eventually he's going to make it. And it's this sort of like unknown conclusion that you want to believe that all of that effort is going to be rewarded, which is Tosaka's viewpoint, right? Her thing is that like when people work hard and if they're doing the right things, they should be rewarded for it. And that's why she can't understand Shido's life is because he works harder and he's nicer than anybody. And he, his life has been fucking awful to him. Um, then he's getting beat up and cut up and he can't feel happiness. Um, but then you get this with Sakura. There is this sadder version of it where, you know, she knows that he can't do it. There's this more pessimistic edge at the end. And I think that's a really key moment here. Also, that sets up the dynamic of the relationship here. Yeah, there's actually a bunch of imagery in the film tied to the high jump um, mm -hmm. in a bunch of little uh, shots, including... There's this water bottle he drinks early in the movie um, uh -huh. that has the 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 label on it is someone effectively doing a like running and having a leg up to to do a jump, getting ready to do a big jump. So that becomes a major symbol throughout this film. And of course, it is like that is the like defining Shiro Emiya image, right? Is the jumping over and over and failing and failing. And as you say, there's kind of two possible endings to it because this is a story with multiple roots. There is the kind of unlimited Blade Works Reen version of like, but maybe one day you make the jump. And then there is this, which is, okay, well, you weren't able to make the jump. Now what? And I do feel like that's the driving question of Heaven's Feel is, because this is a movie where by the end of this, everyone has failed. No one on team on the good side has done anything, mm -hmm. has achieved anything by the end of Heaven's Feel 1. And in fact, everyone's pretty much lost. Now what? And I think that is, you know, this is, I wouldn't quite say like, and if they never made another movie past this, this would still be great because there is so much set up. But it is still on its own terms. It is a great close-ended movie because of how beautifully it arrives at those questions, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how fully it feels like it 
explores the dynamics of this character relationship that presented in this movie. Well, obviously, like having it be set up for how is this relationship going to develop from here? But even if you just look at it as a bottle story, just exploring the nature of this specific relationship in this moment in time, um, it is it feels like a complete exploration of these two people that are very similar, that they have similar pain and that they are bonding over. And yet they're not they can't quite get there. They're just not quite in sync. Um, they don't fully understand the other person, don't fully understand the pain the other person has. And, and like, you know, just because they're similar, that doesn't overcome the differences that they have. And so they're just a little bit off and they don't know how to like bridge that, that gap between them. Yeah. So before we go for today, uh, have to mention the music by Yuki Kajiura, oh God, yes. who was not there for Unlimited Blade Works. Unlimited Blade Works still had phenomenal music, obviously, but we had her for all of Kari no Kyokai, had her for Fate Zero. This score is tremendous. It does bring back several of the big Fate Zero themes, mm -hmm. I noticed. You have some really good stuff around Saber, where I was like, it actually hit me how much I remembered all that Fate Zero music, just hearing it here. Um, but man, this is a killer score. And like, properly dark to a degree that recalls a lot of Kari no Kyokai stuff. Yeah, and specifically, it does the thing, you know, that a lot of the Kata no Kyokai scores did, that the Mugen Train score does. It, this is something that the other two movies will do as well, where they have their ending theme, for, in this case, Hana no Uta by Eime. All three of the ending themes are by Eime, composed by Kazuya Yuki. Um, and the different melodies, there's like three or four kind of major melodies that that song uses, and those are the basis of a lot of the tracks in the instrumental soundtrack in the movie itself. Um, and that was something fun about rewatching it since I know that song really well. Cause I, live, I love all three of the ending credit songs and I've listened to them a lot in the years since I've watched these movies the first time is you could then like have that pre-built association with those musical ideas and then can see them spread out throughout the whole film. And it's like really elegant how they use the kind of all pieces of that song and, and whatever I, you know, I'm always curious, like how that comes about. Do they always make the song first and then they do the instrumental stuff or is it like you do parts of the song but you're also working on these other instrumental themes you're like oh let's put that melody in here um i'm kind of curious how how that works but it is just like it's this full complete musical expression that is spread out across that whole film that then is um sort of crystallized in this one specific song that amy sings at the end you know i would imagine that the i don't know the exact details on this i would imagine ufo table has their composers and singers roped into the process at a much earlier phase than I think you would generally see in, in anime or film production. And it's part of probably the benefit of they have this stable of people they work with over and over again. You know, they are generally not getting someone to do a theme song just because they're on the like top 40 or something. They often then become that like Lisa yes. and Aime and stuff. But it's like, you know, I, I think if you have someone like Yuki Kajiura and Aime who you can go to, you know, like early in the process and it informs everything. It's so cool. Cause you're right. I mean, Hana no Uta is a just heartbreakingly gorgeous song. It's all from yeah. Sakura's POV. It's extremely striking. It has, you mentioned this back when we reviewed Mugen Train, the Demon Slayer movie, you talked about how much it the, that, that movie song, Homura, reminded you of how they use it in the Heaven's Feel movies. Mm -hmm. And it is the exact same process where it's just like you sit there through the credits, not just because the song is so good, but because like it feels like it's a part of the movie. It feels like you would be just cutting off the movie early if you didn't sit there and watch the song as it goes by. Yeah, and it's just an amazing song. And, and this is something that when we get to the third of these movies, we'll have to just talk about all three of the songs together also. Because, like, for me, my, like, thing with the end credit songs for these movies is that I kind of see them as really being one really long song that's in three different phases. Um, because all three songs are written from Sakura's perspective that kind of trace her journey throughout the three films. Um, but it's like the writing for the lyrics on these songs are so beautiful with this um, one being all about um, the flower petals, right? So there's a lot of imagery of like the Sakura trees that are used here for obvious reasons because it's Sakura, right, is her name. Um, but also it's, you know, you have kind of the passage of time. We're coming into winter. So the Sakura trees are, you know, out of bloom and stuff like that. So there's these lines about like cold flower petals, like scattering in the night, falling on people like snow, um, you have, I think my favorite, we have the one line that's about, like you said that, you know, if anything, if I do something bad, you promised you'd get mad at me. That's why I believe you'll be able to find me once again. I won't have to be in a lonely place anymore. Right. 
the flower petals I gazed up alone have scattered. That's the last line in the song, um, which is very ominous and dark. Um, you also have the first line in the song, um, which I remember very well for reasons we'll talk about in the third movie. Um, but Sono Hibe wa Yume no Yoni, um, which is those days were like a dream. Uh, but my favorite line, um, looking for it now, is here it is. Uh, Even two battered hearts, when put together, can surely give birth to something kind. Uh, that line, and I'm just going to read it out in Japanese because I really like the way it's written in Japanese as well. Giza giza na kokoro datte. Um, and that notion of this is like the thing that Sakura is trying to believe in, that these two hearts, um, the battered hearts is what this translation have, has, but Giza Giza is also kind of like, it's like, it's an onomatopoeia, so it's sort of like jagged, you know, it's like almost like you broke it and it's got like all the pieces and you're like trying to fit them together, right? Like two different hearts that shattered, that were broken, that you're trying to stick together. Um, and that like if you try to do that and you can stick them together, something kind will be born from that process. And that's what she's trying to do with her senpai, with Shido. Um, and I think this is like such a beautiful, heartbreaking image. Um and, and there's something about the lyrics of these songs that you're getting this insight into Sakura's POV and how she's seeing the events and how she's sort of seeing Shido and what she wants from him. Um, I think it's like, it's something where like if people have watched the movie but have not like listened to the song with lyrics, you really have to because that's so to me like an essential part of how they, of the story of these movies. And particularly as a fan of the original story and of Sakura's character and everything, like in many ways, the ending credits, the three ending credit songs are like my favorite part of these films as like this additional like poetry, basically, from Sakura's perspective that tells her side of the story. It's such a cool thing that they like, nobody said that they need to go this hard on making these such essential pieces of the <laughs> storytelling. Um, you know, most movies do not put that much thought and, and energy into the end credit song. Um, but it does add so much if you really kind of dig into it. it. Adds a lot of layers to the characters of the movie. Yeah, that line, even two battered hearts when put together can surely give birth to something kind. That sounds like that should be like the tagline on the poster. Yes. Like that should be like the text on the poster of like Shiro and Sakura together. That is, that's the movie. That's what it's about right there. Yeah, totally, totally stunning. Yeah, love it. Yeah, and again, we will, like, when we do the third movie, we'll have to, before we watch it, sit down and spend 15 minutes just listen to all three of the songs one after the other while reading the lyrics, because it's, like, <laughs> it's so good. It's yeah. so remarkable how, how well they put that stuff together. I will make sure to do that before we get to the third movie, but, yeah. Can we just, like, take off work tomorrow and just do the second movie, Sean? Unfortunately, no. I, I, do, have to, <laughs> I do have to do my job. I do too, but I don't want to. I want to watch more Heaven's Feel. This is so it, good. It would be very funny to put in, like, uh, go into the subsystem and, like, put in an absence and, like, <laughs> just say it's like, oh, note to administrator. Like, why am I going to be asked of this? Like, I just really want to watch an anime movie and podcast with my buddy. No, just just in the, in the subsystem, right? Like a boring flower petal. I forgot my pain, crying and laughing softly on your back. I'll be back Tuesday. <laughs> yes. I just write in here, I strongly clung to the hand you playfully stretched out to me, and finally a warm light is lit upon the world I had given up on. Japan Animation Station